O Lord of hosts, be with us, for we have none other help in times of adversity but Thee. O Lord of hosts, have mercy on us. Welcome everybody to tonight's live stream. As you guys know, it is me and David Patrick Harry tonight, and we're going to have a good time. We are going to cover, we're both diving into this, this furious issue. I mean, the internet has just yeah. blown up the last year yeah. with the topic of red pill, manosphere, feminism, dark triad, <laughs> right? Game, pickup yep. artist, top G, Rolo, Pearl, you name it. This is the whole internet talking about it. And He's covered it, I've covered it, and I imagine we're both going to be covering it pretty heavily in the near future because it's so yep. hot of a topic. And hopefully we can arrange maybe some debates and discussions. I think you're trying to get something going with Rolo. Um, and I do want to give a shout out to Rolo because uh, tonight I'm going to be covering with my buddy David here the paper that he did a, a live stream about. Uh, it's called Signaling Virtuous Victimhood as Indicators of Dark Triad Personality. So if you guys know about the red pill or the history of pickup artists, uh, the net, that niche, then you know about the dark triad. You know about this characteristic, which is the three triad. The triad is Machiavellianism, Narcissism, and Psychopathy. So we're not going to spend the whole night on that and, and how that relates to what they call virtuous victimhood and virtue signaling through victim status. Mm -hmm. and why that's an, uh, an advantage. We're going to get into all that in a minute. We're also going to be talking about uh, David's live streams that he's done on the phenomena of Red Pill and the different characters and the pros and the cons. And so where, where do you want to kick it off tonight? Because you've done, uh, you've done a stream, I've done a stream, and, and I know we're going to be doing more streams on this. What's, what's on your yeah. mind first? I guess to get into it is for those who aren't aware kind of what the manosphere and the red pill is, because a lot of it, and I think that's the misnomer is I do want to debate and get into this fear and, and debate people, but we probably agree with a lot of what they talk about. And so a lot of the ills of the world right now, men being disenfranchised, what's called the lost boy generation, uh, looking for role models, trying to find status and a place to to uh, find themselves really in the world, uh, we can all agree with. We can agree that, uh, you know, Rolo talks about a gynocentric worldview, basically that the world is is being uh, oriented around women. Don't disagree with that really either. I would say our critiques as traditional Christian men is going to come to a what, why would somebody become high value? What's the point of being high value? What's the point of getting these virgin pure women uh, what's the point of a man in society? And I think that's where the red pill and the manosphere kind of is too myopic. And it kind of deals with really important issues for men right now. But the, you know, you'll hear anybody who's been really into uh, Rolo stuff, they'll say, oh, red pill is a praxeology. It's not an ideology. And of course, they have no philosophical understanding that, uh, you know, red pill is not engineering and mathematics. Uh, it's definitely an ideology. It's built within presuppositions of how how men should be or how society should be and how the society is. So Manosphere is really blown up, as even Rolo's talked about. The, the Manosphere that really got going with the game and in, uh, in the whole late 2000s, early 2010s, it's very different now in the 20s. Post-2020, it's a whole new thing. And obviously the Tates, yep, Neil Strauss. I got that book actually too. I got my I, I, game Bible right here. You got your Bible. Look, I'm gonna be a Bible thumper. Bible, I'm a Bible thumper, but it's the game Bible. No, I'm just joking. Yeah, uh, I've got a lot of those books over here too, just sitting around. And and I read I read Rolo for many years, and I read Return of Kings. I read you know Rush's site for many many years. So you know I know this uh, domain. I know the thought process, and it, and it's it's I think I totally agree with what you're kind of laying out at the beginning is. There's a lot of pieces of the puzzle that they have. Yeah. And and and, and to, when we get really precise, uh, I'll even go so far as to agree with Rolo's point against like Jordan Peterson, because I was listening to a really long stream that he did. And he was critiquing Jordan Peterson, not on everything, but just on certain areas, like when Jordan Peterson continues with that sort of, it's really an annoying trad con position that, well, it's time to man up, bucko, man up. <laughs> And it's like, well, now, wait a minute. As a classical liberal, 
what's the motivations for me as a young man? Why am I supposed to man up? Right. right. And I thought Rolo has a really good critique of that. Maybe we can talk about that later. That's getting really precise, but yeah, but yeah. So like, tell us more about like when you encountered manosphere and, and what, what, what do you, what did you think it was? What it, cause it used to be first red pill was like conspiracy stuff. Then right. red pill became men's issues and it sort of just morphed into a lot of different things. Well, I think, and that's what, you know, you hear red pill back in 2016 with Trump and it had to do with, you know, almost libertarian understandings of the Fed Reserve and the New World Order and and uh, that there's a larger agenda in 2020 being based in red pill were synonymous. And I, I, it seems like red pill, because of the explosion of the manosphere, it's basically been totally oriented around male female relationships at this point and so the red pill then is trying to fix the sexual dynamics between men and women in the 21st century and and you know you look at somebody like kevin samuels who's now passed away i don't know if you're familiar with him he was a an african-american man down in atlanta who he blew up on the scene he had i remember i watched a few videos this was like uh early early to 2020 um, he, he had it, he was in the low thousands, maybe 20,000 subs or something like that. And then within just a few months, he was over a million subs and he would start to have women on and he would ask them questions about, Oh, what do you want? What's your dress size? How tall are you? How much do you weigh? What does your face look like when you get out of the shower? And then he would just give them a reality check. He's like, lady, you're, <laughs> you're five, five and you weigh 200 pounds. You're not going to get a man who makes six figures and and this blew up on the internet because he was given like this dose of reality to women. I would say Rolo is still probably the preeminent manosphere red pill uh, promoter. I would say he's probably the most articulate. Um, he's probably got the best arguments, but now there's all these quacks and, and these young guys on, on Twitter, you see them, they're like showing their Lambo and the Bugatti or, I mean, not the Tates specifically, but other guys, and they're like, oh, yeah, I, I got this girl last night. She had a fiance and, yeah, I fucked her right in the club, man. You know, hive out in it. And it's like, dude, what? Like this, this is supposed to be the manosphere now. It's just like these men that are totally hedonistic. And they're just, it's just like now about a numbers notch and getting many, many as women as you can. And it's like, well, what is the role of masculinity? What's the role of men? Is that, is that why people should brag? And I've seen this before bragging about, how many virgins they sleep with. And it's like, as a religious man, I don't disagree with their even assessment on what a high value woman is submissive, feminine, fit, pretty, uh, pure. Don't disagree with all that stuff. But then why are you also sleeping with girls that are virgins? And then you're criticizing girls for being only fans and having high body counts. That seems contradictory. If you're not going to marry them, why are you sleeping with virgin girls? And so it's like, the manosphere, at least to some degree, I'm not saying that Rolo says this, but generally speaking, as a cultural phenomenon, it's br bridged into the whatever podcast, Pearly Things, who our friend Ra Rachel Wilson has been on, really talking about feminism. And so it's it's weird. It's like this. It's a new space to talk about sexual dynamics. And I think people haven't been able to express. And that's why it's just exploding like wildfire on social media. Yeah. I, <clears throat> but even before all that, I remember... Uh, the first phase or cycle of this was, I mean, there was a phase of dudes that were doing the PUA Frank TG yep. Mackey stuff in the two thousands, but like mystery yep. and like, and, yep. and Rolo was first kind of blogging back when mystery mm -hmm. got popular. And then, uh, when, when Russo return of Kings and you know, his stuff that was really kicking off like 20, uh, 11, 12, 13, 14 is when that was starting to get some traction. And I forget, I forget what year the game actually came out, but there was a, an important element to this, which also came about, which was men's rights. So men's right. rights came about because a lot of the legal system was seen to be uh, extremely disadvantageous to men and bent against any of the arguments of the men or the fathers in those situations. Right. Always just, well, uh, women are always right, which became like some stupid hashtag, right? Which is complete nonsense. And <laughs> right. Right, I mean, just crazy stuff. And so there's the men's rights element of it that was kind right. of uh, its own thing. And there was the spearhead. And there was a guy, I cannot remember the name of the, there was a professor, Dr. Dr. Somebody, and he ran the Spearhead website. And I used to listen mm. to all these podcasts. I read all this stuff. And then Red Pill kind of, it was like overlapping uh, with men's rights and then and, and the social dynamics stuff and, and conspiracy stuff. Because originally, mm -hmm. 
as I know you know, but for those that don't know in the audience, the red pill is from the matrix. I mean, yeah, it goes back to total recall, but the popularization of it is the matrix where, you know, Neo has a choice between, uh, is he going to wake up to how the world world really works? Or is he going to stay in the system and take the blue pill? So it had to do, like you said, back then with, in the two thousands with federal reserve and the stuff that Alex was talking about and all that kind of stuff. So it's kind of been, an amorphous elastic thing that's been able right. to be pasted on a bunch of different things. But it is really surprising to me that it kind of made its way back in the last couple of years. But I did watch an interesting Rolo video where he makes the argument that actually this, the red pill thing actually goes in a cycle. And so there was a cycle of it before, you know, 2016, back in 2012, 13, when, you know, Russian return of Kings is really popular. And then there's going to be another cycle of all of this, after he says that after the election, you'll notice a lot of these people who will gain a lot of influence and traction. He's like, after the election, uh, the next election, they'll die away and they'll disavow it. And he, he made a good point that Candace Owen, I didn't even, I forgot this. I actually remember this because she used, she used to go on uh, Ralph back in the day. And at that time, she was Red Pill Black. That was her handle on Twitter. So she was dealing, dealing with red pill issues, and then it then she transitioned into being basically just uh, a political commentator, right? Right. Um, not not that I care. I don't care whether she talks about politics or whatever. I'm not knocking her. I'm just saying that this is what this was the trek she took, and so right. a lot. And and, and R- Rolo's making a good point, which I think is true, is that he's saying that if you watch a lot of these red pill people, they're going to disavow red pill after the election because they're riding a wave to get popular. And then they'll transition into being political conservative, normie conservative commentators because right. this cycle has happened in the past. And I think that's really important to notice because and I, I'm not calling anybody specifically out. I don't really care what other, I, can, I don't know people's motives and I'm not interested right. in judging people's motives. But what I do know is that this is a recurring pattern that a lot of these red pill people right now will transition into just being normie political commentators after the next election. And so you can tell there is going to be a, there's a, there's a grift phase that goes on is what I'm trying yeah, to say. That's what I was going to say. A lot of grifters in this sphere. And, uh, and that's why I, I partly, I want to get into, and, and you too, I'm sure is just to kind of debate some of these guys. Cause it is kind of built on uh, sand, their houses. Now, again, a handful of people like Rolo uh, have been there from the beginning and have gone through all these different various phases. Like you said, uh, it was conspiracy, conspiratorial, it moved into men's issues, and the manosphere as a title was actually a derogatory term created by feminists to describe all these men talking about, as you said, men's rights and men's issues. And this has just blossomed and grown, and, and especially in the last three to four years, where it's, I mean, as we were talking about in Nashville, I mean, this is like the hottest topic on YouTube now. You can't scroll YouTube without your YouTube shorts or YouTube clips from what all these different podcasts, whether it be Pearly Things or Fresh and Fit or Rolo or the whatever podcast, it's in your face. It's everywhere. So this is clearly one of the hottest topics and something that people want to talk about. It's because people can't have good relationships right now. And we can get into it. And I think that's going to be partly tied to secularism. In the way that culture is, and I would argue, and if I was to debate somebody, I would make this debate because I was supposed to, I was supposed to debate uh, Spencer Cornelia uh, tomorrow night on the Crucible. He's got a big YouTube channel that exposes like fakes and frauds and stuff on marriage. He says men shouldn't get married, and I was, I was basically going to grant him all his premises and say, yeah, if you're secular, probably not a good idea because how are you going to go about finding a woman that you can actually trust? Uh, you know, and what's the point of the relationship? That's the other thing is like for us as Orthodox Christians, you know, you get married to have a family, you get married to commit uh, not just a legal, but a spiritual uh, union with somebody, a vow that you're going to be with them for eternity. That's a little bit, that's totally on a different level than the manosphere and the red pills talking about relationships. So um, I was going to, he backed out of it, but we were going to supposed to do a debate t- tomorrow night that I don't know if I'll be doing with anybody or not, but um, I grant them that, you know, like you said, the court systems, uh, divorce courts, uh, child custody, all this stuff, it's all oriented against men. The bigger question then is why? And this is where I would have a beef with Rolo. Somebody pointed out because he had that viral tweet that said, you know, don't get married, don't have children and get a vasectomy is the, the quickest way to become a high value man. 
And that implies, even though Destiny and Sneeko try to push him on, well, what, what is a high value man? He was kind of reluctant to define and said, well, it's, oh, everything's contextual, meaning relative, um, that I would say, no, there are objective things that we can qualify what a, what a high value man is. And we can get into those here in a few. But now, a quick question. So yeah. the guy that you uh, I'm not familiar with the person that you're talking about that you were going to have the debate with now, is he MGTOW? Because MGTOW kind of is its own thing, right? Which is like. So out of the men's, uh, the, the the pot of the men's sphere, there sort of eventually became these schisms and divisions to where there's the sort of the right. the men's, uh, well, there's men's rights. There's the guys who are, you know, pickup artists, social dynamics. Here's how to make you into a high value male guys. And then there was the division of what would become MGTOW slash incel guys who had decided that, no, I want um, SEX bots. I want, uh, you know, <laughs> literally, right? Like, because right. some of those, some of those popular channels from a few years ago, I don't know if they still exist. Like, uh, poop flinging monkey and Barbarossa or whatever. Like, they became full on. Like, never get. It's actually bad to get married. Period. Um, yeah. Having any uh, sex relations is actually bad. We should have sex bots, literally. So that's the course that some of those you know people took in terms of incel. So is that is this a guy who's uh, which camp is the guy you're talking about? No, uh, I think no. He has a prominent YouTube channel, like four hundred thousand or something, and he basically exposes like uh, fakes and frauds, tax cheats, hustlers on the internet, people selling fake courses, stuff like that. That's how he grew his channel. But more recently, um, he's kind of developed a friendship with a handful of people in the manosphere. So he's been on like Fresh and Fit and like uh, Access Vegas with Rolo and and people. So he's kind of dipping his toes in there, but I again, I don't know his personal story. I'm, I believe I haven't watched all the stuff that he has gone through a divorce, and so he's like, he looks like he's in maybe his mid thirties or or maybe later thirties. I'm not so he, he, you know, still got a lot of life ahead of him, um, but I would probably grant him any of his premises. So I don't think he's MGTOW per se, and that is like you said, there's like the red pill. The blue pill, which is a derogatory term, the red pill, which means, you know, you're awake to the matrix. And then you have the black pill. And that's becoming more and more popular with the the, the nihilism, the far right wing. Uh, this usually gets into almost racial stuff, the black pill, because there's nothing for them to, to hang on to anymore. Uh, and then you have the men going their own way, the MGTOW. I don't think Spencer was part of one of those groups. However, he echoes a sentiment that we find, you know, common throughout the manosphere, whether it be Coach Greg Adams or various people telling men, oh, don't get married, don't get married, don't get married, you know, just have a girlfriend or spin plates, have multiple girlfriends. And um, again, the point I would ask is, well, what's the point of sexual relationships? What's the point of getting married in the first place? And it's going to get to family creation and then it's going to get to what's best for children um, and all these other things that I think that they just don't focus on per se, because that's not, you know, it's more about male, female sexual dynamics and why it's all falling apart. And it's a fact it is falling apart. I mean, it, you luckily haven't been single <laughs> recently, but uh, glory to God, I have my fiance and, and we'll be getting married soon. But, dude, it's terrible out there uh, it, it, with the only fans. And this is where, again, I grant the manosphere and the red pill. Look at these girls. Look at the young girls at her dating age from, from 18 to 35 or 40. It's terrible. Narcissism, self-absorption, social media. Um, well, you know, and uh, people, people overlook that a lot of the girls, too, are uh, on pills and SSRIs, which is an, a big issue, too. And birth control, which totally all, all the pharmaceutical cocktail. Yeah. 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 And, and, the, and there's multiple studies that shown that birth control uh, makes women basically choose more effeminate men. And then, you know, there's, I, I, I think even Candace Owens did a whole thing on this about how uh, she's against birth control and talking about all these rates of divorce where women, they'll be on birth control, they'll get married to this guy, then they have to get off birth control to have a baby, they have a baby, and then they look at this guy and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm like not attracted to you. You're not going to be the provider or the protector of me and the child. And and then they feel totally unhappy with the relationship and they get a divorce and and it's true 75 to 80 percent of all racial demographics women initiate divorce so again granting the manosphere and the red pill like what's the upside of getting married well it depends on where you're coming from and what is the point of of these relationships and and yeah so we can begin to define i have a handful of things just defining again at, at, at a precept level like what is the red pill and the red pill is well, tied to... Hold on. Before you get into that, I have a question yeah. for you. Yeah, yeah. I have a question for you about some of the previous uh, discussions that you've made. 
that I think is actually really uh, relevant for what we're talking about tonight because I didn't even realize it until uh, like a day or two ago that the stream that we that we planned on doing before got postponed. I was feeling like crap. I had a, like a bug. And it ended up being that we're doing it tonight on Father's Day in America, which is hilarious because, I mean, this is right, the Patriarchy Day. So, exactly. you know, the, the feminism succeeded through a lot of things, through a lot of money and a lot of support from very wealthy families, oligarchs, foundations, think tanks, and so forth. And just the sort of inherent uh, virus nature of leftism and all that, that it was able to sort of worm its way into all of our institutions. And one of the ideas behind it, which we'll get into, I'm sure, in a little bit, is not just the idea of a society organized around so-called fairness and egalitarianism, but also this idea that there are no boundaries. And the patriarchy is bad because somehow phallologocentrism is, it creates boundaries and that's bad because boundaries limit you, man. You be whatever you want. I can identify as an attack helicopter if I want to, man, right? It's a... Right. Literally, I could be anything one day, identify something else the next day. And that's the root of this idea that there are no limits or boundaries to to reality. Uh, there's no metaphysical essences of things. Things don't have natures. Right. We can determine whatever they are from our own postmodern magical thinking perspective. So tell us why boundaries are actually good and why they're mm. absolutely necessary to function at all. And how right. that's connected to, to patriarchy, to men. Right. So again, what if you get into like, what is the role of masculinity? And as you pointed out, uh, Jacques Derrida in his uh, famous book, Grammatology, says, well, it's this thing that's the central pillar of Christianity. It's it's what he called foul logocentrism, privileging the, the phallus masculine principle, logocentrism, looking at a logos worldview, oriented worldview and focusing on the center, the middle. And he said, what we got to do to undermine this is focus on marginalization. And we have to take the marginal and make that the center, take the center and move that to the fringes. And anybody who's watched commercials nowadays would probably see that's exactly what's going on. And this is how he believed it would undermine the patriarchy, because he thought, again, the patriarchy upholded boundaries and moral structures, and we needed to erode those. And so when we look at our society, the boundary between men and women dissolved. The boundary of nation states dissolved. The boundary between man and machine dissolved. The boundary between man and animal dissolved. That we see what I would argue is a henosis, is a neoplatonic uh, term for the, really a, a different understanding of what we would consider theosis. It's like this dissolution of all boundaries, so everything becomes unified, and this is supposed to be the end point of mystical of the mystical process. And I would say, no, this is like a satanic henosis. Everything is one, dude. Oh, everything is one, dude. I just did the biggest hit ever. Oh. And I saw everything as one, which, oh, wow, you came to the realization of what every ancient pagan religion ever said. Everything's one. Yeah, right. It's really deep, dude. But uh, this actually has consequences, like you're saying, right? The, the, right? the working out of this leads to social destruction. And a lot of people don't realize this stuff can be weaponized and can be used to break down societies. Of course, we talked with our friend Rachel, you know, in her book, she talks about the uh, occult roots of feminism and witchcraft, how a lot of mm -hmm. women's liberation comes out of witchcraft. And, you know, you couldn't have the crazy, insane, postmodern denial of all uh, essences and boundaries that we have today without prior, pr without having feminism first. So right. feminism prepares the way for the, the destroying of all boundaries by first destroying that notion of the boundary between uh, legitimate roles for men and women. Right. Which rightfully so that both rachel and andrew wilson point out is that it has to do with men feminism only existed because men granted the right so so this process and that's where i point that it's the whole it has to do with men allowing the boundary to dissolve you can still point to the islamic world and this is not an apologetics for islam but it still maintains its patriarchy and the men are still then in control of that society so the western man has slowly given away the boundaries and something i've spoke with even father peter hears is that i equate this with the fall adam simping for eve adam turning his back on god the, the true patriarchy that true uh maintaining of the boundaries whether it be king ahab and jezebel Men simping and choosing like sexual pleasure and the sexuality of women over its relationship with God, over these higher callings, these transcendental values. This is what allows us to begin to dissolve these boundaries at a societal level. How did everybody choose this? And so the boundaries are essential. And so men always maintain boundaries. That's what war is about. 
That's what uh, defending your home is about. That's what value structure is about. And so shout out to all the fathers out there for Father's Day. And that was one of the things that I would level at the manosphere and the red pill people is like, what part, what patriarchy are you a part of? You see, we're Orthodox Christian. We're part of basically the last patriarchy in, in Christendom, the true patriarchy going, you could argue, all the way back to Abraham. Uh, what patriarchy are you a part of? Because they want to criticize feminism or some of the um, moral indecency of contemporary women. But it's like, bro, I'm part of an institution that goes back ages that is, this is our this is our worldview. You're doing this as an isolated, atomized person. Like it's totally less effective and you're not part of any actual patriarchal tradition. One of the elite texts that I was just reading, I'm trying to remember which one it was, uh, was actually discussing that uh, present day Islam has not yet completely capitulated to the Western geopolitical strategy of pushing uh, feminism. Um, mm. I, I'm trying to remember which text it was. Now, that's not a concession to, oh, therefore Islam is based in trad, bro. Because actually the document, right. is just, it just said that we haven't got to them f fully yet. <laughs> we'll eventually get to them. And the irony is that, of course, when a lot of uh, Islamic people who end up in the U.S. or in the West, they actually, just like all the other immigrants in a generation or two, turn into totally Americanized right. individuals as well. So it, the document wasn't conceding that Islam is trad and bays it's just saying that we haven't gotten them fully on board with what we are pushing for the whole world yet but we will right and, and and they believe that they will and the the islam and that's one of the things that i would argue that it's probably and this i mentioned this at montanica to bishop maxime that i said you know really the greatest threats to orthodoxy is not atheist Anybody still thinking that atheists are going to like convert and apostatize the orthodox? Like you're you're out of touch. The biggest threat to to people in orthodoxy is people that believe in the occult, and I think Islam's going to grow because oh, absolutely. Islam is yeah. Islam is going to be this place, especially for these manosphere type young men. Well, well, you know, I'm disenfranchised in the West. I have no social status, but you know, uh, you know. If I become a Muslim that, like Sneeko and, uh, you know, yeah, get your virgin I'll, bride. I'll get my virgin bride. Exactly. Yeah, they'll get their virgin bride. They don't have to do anything. They just have to submit to Islam. And it's like, bro, that like that's not masculine either. That's just another form of consumerism. That's just a coomer. It's like, bro, the point is, and I agree with the man where you got to work on yourself. But this is where theology and actually taking philosophy here. I think this is part of masculinity as well in regards to spiritually leading somebody. So. Again, we can get into anywhere you want to go at this point, but I well, think one last point on Islam yeah, yeah, there, which is that so a, a lot a lot of the recent manosphere individuals, uh, obviously the largely because of the Tate acceptance of, and I know it's I don't know exactly if Tristan has fully accepted Islam. No, I, I saw that, recently with the did you see the Patrick Bet David? I have not. Tristan I'm, still says he's Orthodox Christian. Okay, so he hasn't and, fully accepted. And Andrew, yeah. as a Muslim, has actually pulled back on some of his stuff. So it's no longer get the Ferrari to escape the Matrix. He's saying, okay, you got to do. He 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 slowly in that that interview again. I was listening to. He's kind of changed his tone on a little bit of issues that I would argue are a little bit more closer to our side of things as a traditional religious person. So, again, I don't know the sincerity of his heart. I'm not here to talk about their faith or orthodoxy or Islam, but just about what they say and how that ripple affects in culture. Well, one thing that uh, somebody had a good critique of, it might have been you. I can't remember who was critiquing the reasoning of... Uh, some of the uh, the Tate interviews where he was talking about why he accepted Islam. It was essentially the same psycho theology of Jordan Peterson, where God is a concept that really is the uh, exemplification of my self-help strategy. Right. It's like, well, dude, that's not what God is. And so it seems like he was sort of saying, oh, Islam will function as this for me as a right. way for me to put God into a system that allows me to say, well, I'm this because that allows me to, um, you know, do better in life and to get Bugattis or whatever. And I mean, and, and I know Jordan Peterson doesn't say that the purpose of the, the God archetype or whatever is to get you Bugattis, but he basically has a similar idea that God is this sort of archetypal thing that helps you in the psychological process of right. working out your issues, not an actual personal God. That's the key thing. Right. Here. Yeah, it, it's a utilitarian approach to religion. Exactly. So, and so whether it be, 
And and I could see multiple factors for Andrew. Again, I don't know his heart, so I'm not here to claim what his intentions were. But I, just as an outsider, I could see that if you were him and you were being investigated by the Romanian government um, and you had all this money and you had all these dealings with the Middle East and they have their own banking system and the West is trying to debank you, it makes sense why it would be very uh, pragmatic to become Muslim because now you have access to an entire economy and social system that isn't trying to, you know, put you in jail and debank you, but actually allows you some type of maintain your status and you become an idol for the entirety of the Muslim yeah, world. Yeah. By the way, yes. Yeah, so people in the chat, you're right. Uh, it was it was that was Jim Bob stream critiquing uh, JBP and uh, Tate. That's right. That was his that was his argument, and that's a really good point because. Yeah. Um, if, if God is just a conceptual thing that we can make it into whatever we want to, you know, make us into self-help bros, then that has nothing, that's not, that's just basically nothing, right? That, that's right. not a God. That's just a, that's just another self-help path. And so right. it's like, like David said, it's, it's just utilitarian. So now, uh, you said you had a list of five things that were red. Yeah. Pill. Yeah. Did you want to, to do that? To define like what the red pill worldview is. Cause you know, we do philosophy and theology. So I always like to see what the paradigm is. And, and so the red pill is built upon evolutionary psychology, evolutionary biology, and evolutionary understandings of sociology. And so it's already rooted in a, in a structure that really doesn't give you moral objectivity. It gives you, okay, this is the way it happens, and this is how we evolved, and this is why women like this. And uh, me as an Orthodox Christian, I don't believe in mag revolution. I think it's actually a, a nonsensical oh, worldview that I, has no evidence. I, Speciation, I can yeah. get on on board with. The idea that people evolve based on niches, but mag revolution, the, the leap between species, there's no evidence. I mean, no, no serious academic even maintains that because the probability doesn't even match up. Well, one thing I would say on this point is that I agree with you there about uh, the transmutation of species. I don't think that's a, a very sensible or coherent theory at all about the origin of life and whatnot. However, uh, we as, I think, I don't know of anything in Orthodox theology or in our system that would contradict the notion of adaptation. And so right. what I think a lot of what evolutionary psychology is studying in particular is precisely uh, adaptive strategies of different societies and cultures. And I think all of that information is 100% totally relevant. Yep. Um, if you look at the interviews that Dr. Edward Dutton does, uh, who he basically, he's, he doesn't come at this from the red pill perspective. He just comes at it from the academic perspective. He's done a lot of interviews where he basically just makes all of these same points with nothing to do with like the red pill manosphere. He's just making the points from right. the data and from the papers that, you know, there's these, uh, there's certain tendencies in, you know, women to do this. There's certain tendencies okay. in certain cultures for, uh, like he, for example, he had a really good discussion on, um, witchcraft as a survival mechanism for, uh, really basically, uh, ugly, nasty hoes. Okay. So when they, <laughs> when they weren't part of society and they, and they couldn't get I a agree. mate, I already agree with him. They, when they couldn't get a mate, they would turn to these practices that and somehow they thought empowered them or maybe gave them contact with another group of a coven right so they right. found community when they were sort of uh no longer part of the mainline community and a lot of those individuals would be you know unattractive women who couldn't find a mate and whatnot so this is why we get the archetype of the ugly hag right because right. she's the witch that and she's always childless and she's exactly unmarried. yeah exactly and so and so we see I did a whole stream on on the archetype of the old hag. And yes. it, we see that is almost the modern woman. They just haven't aged that far yet. Um, it's it's somebody who's usually, you know, not at the point where they're the old hag with the big nose and the witch hat, but usually sexually promiscuous, unmarried, no children, uh, pursuing their own will. That's what magic is anyways. So it's like, well, geez, it looks like that is agreeing with the manosphere and the red pill. That is the contemporary landscape for most women. Um, yeah, I would so, highly recommend for those that have not uh, heard it, go listen to Dr. Dutton's analysis of uh, witchcraft and feminism. It, it's a fascinating uh, evolutionary psychology approach to this. 
And I would also say too, that there's a lot of information in, in what they call just evolutionary biology. Again, evolution can mean different things, guys. So if, it, if we're referring to the study of how the species evolves to adapt to different circumstances, right. there's nothing unorthodox about that. That's different than a theory of origins that everybody came from a single celled organism and that right. all of the species somehow mutated out of this single cell or origin and it's all atheism and that's two different things now right. for a lot of people they're connected but there's no necessary right, but they're not it's important it's distinction species. speciation is not macro evolution those are two separate yes. processes of which we have we have evidence for speciation and that doesn't go against the creationist worldview it actually makes total sense but macroevolution, I would reject that outright. So the red pill worldview is built on evolutionary psychology, biology, and sociology. Um, they often uh, referred to, I, I wasn't familiar with the doctor you mentioned, but Dr. David Buss and Dr. Uh, God Saad, uh, they, they'll refer to him a lot. Um, then it gets into the gynocentric order. And this has to do with the idea that we live in a, uh, world in which there's a war on masculinity and that everything is is sort of rigged against men and in favor of women, which I don't totally disagree with where I would push the manosphere as I would say, well, why is that? Why is because I would argue it's ultimately getting at a spiritual reality to move us towards a one world inverted order uh, towards the end times, which has to feminize men and get us to become less virtuous and give away these boundaries. And so um, the gynocentrism is part of it. Evolutionary psychology, uh, hypergamy is a big part of what the red pill is. This idea that women are always trying to get their best option, which again, I don't disagree with. And again, if I have a daughter, I want her to get with the best man she can. So this is where I would almost push back on, you know, some of the, the red pill guys that, and I'm not saying Rolo is one of these, but you could see the people who watch his content. Oh, women are hypergamous, women are hyper. Yeah, well, I hope my daughter gets the best man she can. What's wrong with that? From a female perspective, I don't see anything wrong with them trying to get the best man that is available as a suitor for them. So hypergamy is a big part of it, dating up. And so uh, Rolo breaks this down into what he calls beta bucks and alpha, as you can imagine, or beta needs and alpha seeds. And it has to do with betas for a woman in hypergamy, she is, look, she's an, always analyzing two assessments. One, he calls the beta needs, which is protection, parental investment, and provisions, what they can provide. Then women are, he would argue, balancing this with their hypergamous nature with the alpha seed, which is men that are physically fit, attractive, and have the best genetics. And so women then are trying to put their, he argues, they're trying to choose the best suitor based on the beta needs, what they can provide, and then the alpha seed, who they actually are, and trying to get the best man somewhere in between the middle there. Um, yeah, I, I read a book one time, just to interject on that, yeah, and I, I want you to keep going with the yeah. with this list, but... I read a book that was really good on the the biological components of this, which was talking about the different sorts of signals that male and, and female uh, members of various species do. So basically, this is for, for all mammals, right? There's certain traits and certain patterns that you'll notice that they biologically give off mm -hmm. to attract or to... Uh, you know, get a mate. Well, uh, there's some obvious ones. You know, we, we think about peacocking, right? This is the term that the red pill manager uses for trying to show out, uh, to show off, right? Peacocks do this. Spiders do this. There's spiders that right. will like build a, they'll do a little dance. Have you seen that little yeah. spider that does this? And he's doing this to attract a mate. And so there's nothing inherently wrong with this because we're all, all I think all of us sort of biologically wired, obviously to want the best possible mate in all of the criteria. And that's true for men right. and women. There's nothing inherently right. weird or bad or wrong with that. It's, it's a biological hardwiring that we have. Right. And there's a sort of a misnomer with the peacocking because the book, the game, as you pointed out, mystery, the pickup artist, you know, he's like, wear the most outrageous hat or the most outrageous shirt you can wear, or, or you know, don't wear shoes to the bar, do something to like drastically stand out to, for he would consider uh, peacocking to make yourself noticeable to women. Um, but peacocking or making yourself noticeable doesn't have to be that extreme. I mean, again, just by being well-dressed, uh, fit, uh, look people in the eyes, uh, these are ways that you can st stand out in the 21st century. So, yeah. um, again, I, I, like you said, th these are nuances where most of the time we don't even disagree with them. It's just like, 
bringing it back into a sort of a, a, a middle path. One, th one point I would make before you do the next one is yeah. that so a lot of the the people that we're talking about and the information that they put out, they're not interested in actually giving a philosophy of life or a, uh, a totality meaning or any kind of ethical grounding. Right. And, and I, not everybody has to do that. But the problem is that if you're going to predicate a lot of your critiques of modern society and feminism and the, uh, you know, gynocentrism on ethics and morals, we need to know a grounding and a basis for ethics and morals. Exactly. And most of these people don't believe in any grounding in ethics and morals. They end up being relativistic. And the problem is right. that if if that's the case, then there's no reason why really you have that feminism is bad or wrong. It's just as valid as your rel relative. So they basically fall back into a power relations dynamic, which yes. is the leftist position, which is that there is no truth or falsehood. It's all power relations and oppressor oppressed dynamics. Oh, you nailed it. And that would be exactly if I was debating a manosphere guy and they're making these arguments, I would say, bro, you're the only fans chick of masculinity. Like you're the one that has no objective standards. You're the one has has no moral standards. And I think that perspective kind of opened that floodgate when Leela Rose, a Catholic conservative content creator, uh, sort of criticized uh, Justin Waller, who's a big friend of the of the Tates, really handsome guy, tall has his own construction business, millionaire. Um, so he's got all the things that the people are looking for. And he was talking about, yeah, I want to get married. I'm going to have a wife. And he, she said, well, are, you say you want to get married and have a wife and have children, but you're also going to have girlfriends. Don't you think that's contradictory? I mean, you talk about all this discipline and working, but then you don't want to have discipline in regards to like a, a, a faithful marriage. He's like, well, I'm not, just, I'm not, I'm not wired that way. I try to have, I try to be monogamous, but I'm not wired that way. And it's like, bro, that's a cop out. Like, if you're going to have children, then you can make you could make um, an argument for what's the best way children can grow up. And it's not by seeing their dad have a bunch of girlfriends, because that's only going to cause more conflict with maybe animosity between children and father or father with wife. Um, so, you know, like I, they don't have an objective standard to make their arguments and they are giving prescription. One of the guys was upset. This is a praxeology, not an ideology. No, bro. Like, shut up. You don't even know what you're talking about. Even if it is like, okay, but at some point we're going to need some explanation or basis for grounding the morals and ethics. Right. So yeah, it's fine if you want to give just a praxeology, but if you're going to start making these totalizing universal claims about this being bad, this being horrible, this being manipulative, deceptive. Okay. Why is it wrong to be uh, immoral, manipulative and deceptive, uh, deceptive, right? right? So right. we, we yeah. gotta, we gotta have some kind of, um, grounding for the ethical claims or else we, nothing, none of this is going to get off the ground and, and we can't, uh, avoid metaphysics either. As I'm sure a lot of these people would right. like to do, uh, again, we're just going to, I'm sorry, but we're going to be in the domain of philosophy when we start talking about good versus bad. The good is, uh, on the one hand, both ethical and metaphysical, right? right? In classical philosophy, the good relates to being, it relates to what is versus what is not versus negation. Those are all just heavy, heavy, uh, you know, philosophy terms. So we're going to need more than just saying, uh, what's the data? What are the papers, the data? And uh, you know, just get what feels good for you, bro. I mean, it, it's got to be more than that. <laughs> exactly. Because I would say that's feminine. That that That's very feminine. That's, that's, a fem that's exactly right. Yeah. It's consumeristic. It's like, bro, the, the op a man produces more than he consumes. And the boundaries which we establish in our own lives help define us. That's the point. Is, and I, this is where I would agree again with part of the manosphere is that men have to make themselves. Women are born with a sense of innate value because they can give birth to children. Uh, men, you know, we're disposable. That's why we die at war. We, we, we're we the disposable um, sex. But that means you have to make yourself and you define yourself and make yourself through the discipline that you put on yourself to develop, whether it's like you and your philosophy and, and all your knowledge on theology. That took a lot of time, discipline, and effort, but that's what defines a man. No matter what, you could be a mechanic, you could be a plumber, it doesn't matter, but that's what it means to be a man. And so this, this hedonism that they put forth, because they have no objective morality, I would say it makes them like the women they criticize. Well, they because often, they'll point out too that, oh, uh, you know, the society that's uh, gynocentric is necessarily egalitarian and collectivist, which it is. Right, it because is. agreed, and it is. However, 
On what basis, then, am I supposed to prefer the atomized individual classical liberal society? Now, maybe the classical liberal individual society is better, but you're not going to be able to tell me how it's better on your system's bases. All you can ever say is because it's going to give you more feely points and more pleasure points. So why is that better? Says who? Why? It's just arbitrary. And that's where, like you pointed out, it gets back to power. Again, anybody who's studied philosophy knows this is the state of 20th century philosophy with Foucault. It comes down to power. There's no longer objective truth. Right. And that's why you listen to some of these guys. Um, and I'm not talking about just the, the main figures, just the rhetoric within the live chats. It's the women are the enemy. And it's like, bro, you, you've fallen into the same paradigm of the women that you're trying to criticize because they think the men are the enemy. Oh, the radical feminists. Well, then, and I'm not I'm not trying to say they're misogynist or anything. That that gets thrown out way too much just generally on the internet. But now they've totally have this contempt for women. And it's like, bro, you're not gonna get a wife that's gonna submit to you when like you just you know make fun and mock every woman that you see because you are deep down hurt because you've been rejected so many times because you haven't put in the work to become a man worthy enough for a woman to submit to you. Yeah, well, this is just the uh, male version of the feminist slash fat acceptance slash, you know, gross uh, creature who is rather than, I mean, it's a, I mean, there's a lot of vices involved in this. One of those is sloth, right? Right. Uh, rather than self-improving, rather than doing the work uh, that I need to do to make myself better, uh, I'm going to instead blame society for not accepting me and for my own, you know, failures and lack of success. Oh, no, it's everybody else's fault. And so now I'm going to just constantly sort of try to feel better about myself by spending all my time on the internet just dissing, you know, OnlyFans chicks or something like that. Like, right. Th- that that all that is is a concession to also the f- the feminine society that you're criticizing. That's a feminine approach to things. Right. It's a it's an approach that says it's a passive aggressive. I'm going to hide behind the keyboard and just diss everybody all day long when in reality it's because you are you failed and also you're lazy. Right. Right. And I would even tie that mentality with with um, like social justice worries, virtue signaling and even in the orthosphere piety signaling. These are ways in which people can like uh, try to achieve competency or status without actually engaging in those things by by signaling them. So okay, I'm not very masculine. Well, then I'm going to I'm going to berate women and talk about how only fans and how all these girls are whores and stuff like this. It's a way now I can establish my masculinity behind my little handle online. And uh you know, I think this is a real problem. It it's the scapegoating. Whether it's whatever it is, if you're if you're scapegoating, the, the, the ultimate masculine thing to do is just, as Jocko Willing said, take more responsibility, radical responsibility. Everything's your fault in your life, so now deal with it. And that's going to get you to put your life in order. Even if everything in your life is not your fault, one at a certain point you have to come to the realization that nothing out there is going to ultimately i'm not talking about in the religious salvific sense i'm just talking about in your your own personal improvement right, right. nothing out there is going to uh get you the the thing that you're after or that you want or that you that you need right, right. oh i want to i want a, a better job i want this i want that is it is it is it, if you bitch and complain is it going to come to you no it's going to right. take you changing your situation. It's just like the people, it's like fat acceptance is the best example of this. Because <laughs> yep. it's like, you, you can't change society to say, oh no, this way of living is actually healthy. No, no, no. It's objectively not healthy. And so right. to engage in a political crusade to try to get society to change its standards so that you can be unhealthy and then delude yourself that you're still healthy. That's actually a form of victim status which actually suggests here's the crazy part which is paper blew me away i mean i I think we kind of sense this but when we i want you to finish your 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 list there but when we get to this paper what's amazing about the paper uh that we're talking about tonight the signaling virtuous victimhood as indicators of dark triad personality is that most of the time people think oh the dark triad that's the manosphere uh player pickup artists who are using their dark dark triad uh, skills to to get women and to manipulate? Actually, uh, now that can happen, but actually, the typical manifestation of the dark triad is consistently seen. The paper argues 
in people who do not just virtue signaling, but virtuous victimhood virtue signaling. Mm. That's a whole other layer to where, yeah, to where the individuals who are uh, not just virtue signaling, but actually virtue signaling their victim status, they Mm. most often exemplify and consistently exemplify the dark triad traits of Machiavellianism, narcissism, and psychopathy. The very opposite of what is actually the case, right? Because they're always saying, oh, uh, you know, I'm the, I'm a good person. Uh, I'm the victim. I'm oppressed. Think about the video that we've talked about a few, a few times in the past few days, which is where the Pearl was arguing with the women uh, on the Vice clip. Uh, Brittany Selner co- did a video on that clip as well. And at a certain point when Pearl says something, the portly feminist woman says, I don't have to, basically, I don't have to listen to you because you're pretty privileged. I didn't, I didn't get pretty uh, as a privilege growing up. And so that makes me a victim status and my opinions are now better. I'm a more moral person than you because you're privileged. So immediately flipping it into oppressor oppressed dynamic. I guarantee right. you the person saying that has Machiavellian narcissistic psycho- psychopathic traits like we see with most of these feminists and right. these these activists, right? The leftist activists, right? That are they're they're the ones that have the actual Machiavellian narcissistic psychopathy traits and the more they are narcissistic, Machiavellian and psychopathic, the more they signal their virtuous victim status. Right. In related to that, you know, orderliness and cleanliness are associated with godliness, virtue. And as boundaries dissolve, men become more feminine. Society becomes more chaotic. And if you listen to these people say, they're like, oh, well, men, men, no, they want to erect boundaries because it has to do with their ego, their ego, their ego. And it's like, well, you start looking at society and maybe the fact we're dissolving boundaries and men are less ego focused to some degree. Now, it can obviously go off the deep end for sure, but it's caused more mental instability. You look at women and men and their mental health is all over the place. And I would say if society was more ordered and less chaotic, we had more structure and more patriarchy, mental health would go down because people don't know how to deal with the chaos that they're seeing everywhere. And, you know, so when you're talking about the dark triad, to me, that is going to continue to rise as masculinity continues to be, you know, demonized. Yeah. Did you, did you, uh, you had Uh, five on on the the red pill. Yeah. Get through all five and then I'll do some more of this paper. Go ahead. Okay. Um, Another thing that they really talk about is, again, the uh, the dual mating hypothesis, which gets into the hypergamy. So short term physical fitness, sexual attraction versus long term and the investment of resources. Um, one of the things that you'll hear if you listen to like the Fresh and Fit podcast, which really is just Myron, the head guy there on Fresh and Fit. All he does is regurgitate Rolo Tomasi. That's all he does. He brings in basically sex workers and sugar babies in Miami. They come on his podcast um, and they just say the same thing every night. Uh, they just get women that are totally, in, you know, obsessed with themselves and, you know, usually whores that are engaged in some type of sex work. And then they're like, oh, showed you, you're not going to get the high value man because look at your body count. How many people you slept with and X, Y, Z. And they always say men love idealistically and women love opportunistically, meaning men have this idea that. Uh, They're going to lock down a woman and she's going to be true to them for their life and they don't have to worry about it and they can just focus on their stuff where women are constantly, again, hypergamous, looking for the best opportunity to be with the best mate. And um, and so that's another part of this rhetoric, again, just defining the worldview of the red pill. And then it gets to uh, the sexual marketplace value. What is sexual marketplace value? And so this gets into how what is a high value man? And so for Kevin Samuels, it was a man that had a career that made six figures that was somewhat in in good shape. Um, Other people won't put such strict categories like Rolo won't define it as any particular thing. But usually the red pill is always describing a high value man in regards to what you'll hear some people say, oh, it has to do with money, muscles and game. So your money, 
your fitness, and then basically your charisma, your ability to to socialize, your ability to lure people into your sort of uh, social web. Um, and so the sexual marketplace value then is a man, as he gets older, the idea is that a man has very low sexual marketplace value in his early 20s because he hasn't defined himself, again, through the discipline and the boundary erection. So he has to then work, work, work. And then basically they'll say a man in his 30s to 40s is the prime of a man's life. And he then, if he does, if he works well and works uh, to the best of his ability, he'll be successful somewhere around, let's say, 33 to 35. And then he can look back and he can get a high sexual market value woman, which is going to be younger between eight, you know, somewhere between 18 and 24. They're, they'll talk about low body counts, pretty, feminine, submissive, and willing to fit into your frame which we can get into frame. And I'm, I actually really support the conversation on frame because that's one of the problems, even with our Orthodox brothers is really having your life together that a woman can come and help you do what you do. If you don't know what you're doing, how can you have an Eve? Eve is there to help you, but you have to then have a frame. As I like to use the metaphor, you have to have a boat that is, you have to be, you have to set sail. You have to be on your way to a destination that then she can come and help you. So um, they talk a lot about frame, sexual marketplace value. Go I want to let me interject something at this yeah, yeah. point, which is that when you're talking about you know the, the guys in our sphere, uh, this paper is so instructive. Everybody needs to read this paper because as I was reading it and thinking about you know the the leftists and the people in in the you know media that constantly signal signal their victim status as a way to increase social status. The more I thought about it, the more I realized, hey, actually, this is a big part of what is a problem in the religious sphere as well. It's not just a matter of people that are politically signaling their leftism uh, victim status to acquire social status. So many people in the religious sphere uh, are prone to doing the exact same thing where they want to signify their spiritual one-upping and nitpicking. And the irony is that the same critique it would apply to them that in most cases, I would venture that the people who are actually doing this constantly signaling their victim status and their virtue status, right. they're doing this, as the paper says, as a form of resource extraction. And by resource, right. the paper doesn't just mean money. It might mean money. It's saying time, attention, uh, you know, all of these things can be a form of resource extraction through not just being a virtue signaler, but a victim status just think of for example the way uh every time michael lofton makes a video it's always (laughs) that he's a victim uh for example anytime somebody criticizes him it's slander you've attacked him and you need to repent and then he talks about how virtuous and how great he is that's the that's 100 you'll notice and this if you if you follow this paper and you pay attention to the way so many of the piety signalers which drive drive me nuts in the orthodox sphere me too i I, they hit me all the time as well as the evangelical sphere, Roman Catholic sphere, it doesn't matter. All that is is a manifestation of Machiavellianism, narcissism, and psychopathy to get you to manipulate. It's a manipulation tactic, right. as the paper shows, to acquire social status and resource transfer. Exactly. Amen. And, and again, we see it in all spheres. That's why I said it doesn't matter if you're a, a virtue signaler, you're a social justice warrior, you're a piety signaler in the orthosphere, or you're you're a feminist victim of the world, um, or you're a manosphere guy, and your whole angle is being a victim of the world, and how people need to, to you know really you know relate to you and care for you because you're so disenfranchised by the gynocentric order. All this stuff, th- th- this is not a masculine approach at all. Exactly. Um, exactly. No, and, and that's where, as you as well, I know, even within the religious sphere, men use piety to, as you said, acquire social status. As opposed yep. to using skill. Again, well, it's not super- even real piety. It's feigned internet piety, exactly. which is Yeah, it's worse. not even real piety. And it's always public piety, which is the worst form of piety. Which is what Jesus says don't do, right? Go into your prayer room and pray in your corner, Jesus says. Don't pray on the streets like the Pharisees showing everybody how pious you are. That's the worst. And it, he said God doesn't listen to that. So it's a, it's a waste of time. It's performative. You have your reward, he says. And if you read this paper, you'll notice that Uh, As the paper says, the thesis is, I'll read this real briefly. It says, 
We investigate in this paper the consequences and predictors of emitting signals and victim status and virtue. In our first three studies, we show that virtuous victim signal can facilitate non-reciprocal resource transfer from others to the signaler. In other words, the motivation is if I can demonstrate not just that I'm a victim, but that I'm a virtuous victim, I'm able to extract much more out of you, whether that's time, attention, social media attention and clicks, right. empathy, empathy, or money. It might be all yep. of those. Yep. The paper goes on to say, uh, we develop and validate victim signaling scale, and we combine that with an established measure of virtue signaling to operationalize the virtuous victim, victim construct. We show that individuals that have dark triad traits of Machiavellianism, narcissism, and psychopathy more frequently will signal their virtuous victimhood status. And we control for both demographic and socioeconomic variables mm. in the paper. So I'll, the last point here, it says, throughout <clears throat> the study, we show that this is common in Western societies because the West through its democratic structure, it argues later in the paper, has actually elevated victim status to be its own culture, the culture mm -hmm. of victimhood. And mm -hmm. so perceptive and Machiavellian people understand that being a victim is actually a way to accrue social status in the West. That's right. that's crucial. And that's part of that gynocentric society yep. where everybody right. can accrue social status. Oh, I'm a victim, I'm a victim, I'm oppressed, I'm oppressed. Here's what it says at the end. It says, <clears throat> the rest of these studies point out that our thesis is correct, that uh, the frequency of emitting virtuous victim signals predicts a person's willingness to engage in and endorse ethically questionable behaviors, such as trying to uh, earn a bonus or the intention of purchasing counterfeit products. These are some of the papers that are some of the tests that they run later on in the paper. Right. They, they give people these different scenarios to see how they would uh, uh, work. Um, and it says that the result then is that in most cases, those who were willing to constantly signal, signal their victim status were also the ones that were the most unethical is the point. <laughs> yeah, I definitely believe that. I definitely believe that. Um, in regards to, again, just wrapping up here, the red pill, um, you know, the, one of the things that I would definitely agree with them is that men and women want different things. And so part of the the stuff that uh, Kevin Samuels exposed before he passed away was um, you talk to these women, maybe she's OK, she's halfway attractive. She hop on. He would do Zoom things and he would just allow these women to come in and he would. And that's why people it was so popular. People watch because he would just blow them out and almost humiliate them. And so he like, OK, so uh, how old are you? Oh, I'm 33. Okay, uh, what are you looking for? Oh, I I would need a I need a man who makes six figures. He's six foot. He needs to be fit with the six pack and and have a nice job. Okay, how how tall are you? Oh, I'm five foot. How much do you weigh? One fifty, one sixty. Okay, well you're a little big. How big's your dress size? Oh, I'm a I'm a ten or something. And he's like, ma'am, you don't even qualify for that. And she's like, well, I make I make eighty thousand dollars. I have a job. And the point is, men don't give a damn how much a woman makes because that's not our money. And so if I'm getting in a relationship with a woman, it doesn't matter how much money she makes, how driven she is with her career, uh, all these attributes that we would consider masculine. That is not what a what we consider a high value man would be looking for in regards to a woman. And so he really put these women on blast, which became really popular online. So. Uh, women and men are looking for two totally different things. And unfortunately, modern women think that men are looking for the same things that they're looking for. Exactly. So then when they market themselves on the sexual marketplace, they're like talking about the car they drive and how much money they have and how successful they are. And they're like interconnection. They're the circles they're connected to. And yeah, like, I, don't, I don't, I don't care about you being a CEO. I'm not interested in that. It doesn't impress me in one bit. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And so, what a man would be who's high value be looking for is a woman who's pure, a woman who's honest, a woman who's young and pretty, a woman who wants to be a mother, a woman who's submissive to his frame. So a frame is, again, my life, my worldview, what I'm doing, and that a woman needs to accommodate herself to you. And that's where even my Orthodox brothers, guys, do not simp for a woman. 
do not be moving or changing your opinion or changing things about yourself because you want the attention of a woman. That is you fitting to her frame. And I would say even this gynocentrism and these dark triad traits, these are men actually fitting into a female gynocentric uh, frame. Well, like I, I wanted to make a point of that. Yeah, so the paper actually notes that the only way that this could have become a way to increase your social status in the West is if the West had already adopted a uh, radical presupposition of egalitarianism, that everybody is equal, everybody's the same, everybody deserves and has some uh, claim on uh, everything coming equally, right? Which is essentially right. just kind of fundamental, weird kind of Marxism of some kind, some kind of weird kind of socialism, which is just simply, I mean, says who? I mean, nature itself doesn't fit everyone equally. Biology doesn't right. fit everyone equally. Why would we think that therefore everything should come in some sort of uh, equalitarian doling out of everything being fair. That's again, a much more of a, a, uh, a feminine approach to things, right? Right. Based the way your on, mom deals with the, the kids that are upset. Yeah. That's not not based on, society. not based, not, not the masculine approach to what's the objective reality and the facts of the matter, right? Which are right. that, no, nature fits certain uh, people better than others to, for certain tasks. Right. And by the way, that we can still have and uh, equality in some sense, in, in another sense, and be right. unequal in other senses. So that there's another right. presupposition that goes on with this, which is that, oh, all, uh, everything must be one type of thing. Oh, so if we're equal, you we must be always equal in every single sense. Well, we might be equal in the sense of all possessing human nature, but how we exist and have that nature doesn't necessarily have to be the same or equal either. I can, right. Men can have different roles from women and still have the same nature. Right. And that's where a religious worldview is that we complement each other. So the idea that a woman's better with children, the woman is more like, you know, she should stay home, be a stay at home mother, take care of the house. That's, you know, that's because we're, we have different natures. Men are hunters, gatherers. We, we go out and we're more factual. We're or, world oriented. We're trying to do something, build something, find something. And so, you know, th this is just basic human nature that, again, the world we live in now has totally inverted everything. And so the women literally market themselves sexually as men. And then the men, you know, they're becoming more like women. Well, this so yeah, about... that's part of that equalitarian push. And the paper yeah. even even notes that uh, and this is not it's not trying to take a stance. It's trying to look at the data. But the paper even notes that this whole culture has given rise to the idea of the oppression Olympics. So now whoever can be and demonstrate the most victimhood status is actually at the top of the goblin totem pole. And so that's what I was saying the other night was, that, okay, so now the uh, lesbian uh, Islamic Jeffrey Dahmer is at the top of the totem pole because he's the most fringe character. <laughs> but that, I mean, so you see what I'm saying? Like the logic of that is that I'm the most oppressed because I'm the most fringe. There's the fewest of me. I'm right. serious, right? Yeah, no, I know. It, so it's so true. That, the inversion so totem pole, then the, that allows the worst moral people to then say, I am at the top of the totem pole of, of social status because I'm the most oppressed because society doesn't accept that I want to eat people and I'm a, you know, a, a lesbian, m Islamic, uh, cannibal, Jeffrey Dahmer person, right? Well, well bro, I just saw the, the, what was it? It was the ACLU, I retweeted on twitter they just posted a thing like yesterday defending because a man is in prison who is trying to transition to a woman and the prison wasn't letting him transition and recognize his pronouns his crime was that he is a uh, pedophile necrophiliac who viciously stabbed a 14 year old girl years ago and then raped her dead body right, watch out don't get my stream taken down <laughs> oh my bad my bad my bad that's my fine bad. Um, but, um, anyways, uh, he, he engaged in all this stuff and it was totally put to the side and this particular organization put out a public uh, notification, uh, talking about how he was oppressed. He was oppressed by no, the so, jail so this because is they the didn't thing. recognize his pronouns. <clears throat> the paper goes on to say that there are, there's a, a section of the population that is cunning enough to realize that. You can excuse any of your actions if you can figure out a way to fit into a victim status uh, niche of society. And it actually points out that for a lot of the people engaged in the virtue, victimhood virtue signaling, 
that they reasoned that it was that their actions were excused when they were being deceptive and when they were engaging in the dark triad traits because they were victims, you see. Mm -hmm. So because I'm a victim, I'm not subject to the normal ethical constraints and I'm complaining about other people. But I'm a victim, so it excuse, which is that uh, uh, narcissism of the triad, right? right? right. Where I'm, I'm not bound by the rules that I'm applying to everyone else, and I'm my evil is excused because I'm a victim, you see. And right. it goes on to say that that section of the population that is cunning enough to figure that out. By the way, this also applies. Think about how feds work, right? Feds that infiltrate, right? They will do. They will do and operate the exact same way, like COINTELPRO and this kind of stuff. It notes that dark personalities can flourish as social parasites who intentionally ex attempt to extract the resources of their environments without providing any benefit. Similarly, uh, Jones, one of the researchers, theorized that predatory social parasites can use a ver uh, variety of, of mimicry and deception strategies to integrate themselves into different communities so that they can extract the resources of those communities all at once or over time. The great example of this is says are con men who infiltrate themselves into societies to do so. So basically saying that the victim signalers are basically like con men. Right. That makes total sense to me. Uh, just to wrap up the red pill here, I was just trying to finish up by talking about um, the sexual marketplace value. So therefore high value men are men that work on themselves that attain some type of social status, success, monetary wealth, um, and physical fitness in their 30s, and they're going to have the most leverage to then look at the highest value women on the sexual marketplace value, which are going to be young, low body counts, uh, pretty, feminine, submissive, and all these sorts of things. And so the women, they hit what Rolo Tomasi calls the epiphany phase, which is usually around 28, 29, moving into their 30s, where they look, oh man, I've had hot girl summers since I was 18 and got out of high school. And I'm looking around and now all my friends have babies. They're all married. I want to get married too. And so the epiphany phase he talks about is where these girls become religious or they become self-conscious and they start presenting themselves right. in different ways, which we've seen with OnlyFans girls that are already born again Christians and all this type of stuff. So the sexual marketplace, I'm only highlighting that because part of the red pill is understanding this dynamic, how men attain social value, how women attain social value, how women are born with it, how men have to achieve it, have to attain it. And then how these women then who, who lose their value because they go through their twenties and maybe they're very promiscuous. They're doing the clubs every night. They're doing, you know, multiple relationships. Now they come to a state where they become self-conscious of that fact. They're realizing, man, I need to lock down a man. And those high value men don't want those women. So that that creates this whole problem, which now we're seeing in society right now, which we're seeing like the late 20, 30 year old woman who can't get married. Uh, one, because the average man, this is another thing tied to this, is that you look at the sexual like hierarchy. The average man is totally disenfranchised. Well, the average woman that he would be with, say, 200 years ago, they'd be married and have a family. She's probably a feminist. She probably has purple hair like you're talking about, like the ugly witches. Right. Well, weren't they supposed to marry like the guys that are on that level too? Historically, they would have been together, but they're not going to get married. They're not going to have children. So then these guys who maybe they still want to get married, but now they can't. And that's part of this whole MGTOW black, black pill section of men is that they're, they're in a place where they really can't see themselves getting out of it. And so uh, men then have no incentive to marry. This is my my wrapping up the red pill is that men have no incentive to marry because of the divorce, because of the gynocentrism, because of yada, yada, yada. And so the best thing to do is spin plates or have maybe a more of a domestic relationship with a girl. Or if you really want to, or they'll even give the caveat, if you're religious, then you can go get married. Um, so that's generally speaking, a good outline of the worldview, what the red pill is and what they're talking about. Yeah, I want to remind everybody, too, that uh, the show sponsor is Chalk.com, the best supplements that you can get a hold of. Uh, my favorite is, of course, the Tonkat Ali, and that's really relevant to what we're talking about tonight because yeah. Tonkat Ali has proven in peer-reviewed studies to boost testosterone. You can go read the studies that they have over at choq.com. That's Chalk.com. But they have a lot of other options, too. There's the Shilajit, which is great. Jamie loves that for mental focus and clarity. If you're looking for overall uh, supplementation in terms of what uh, minerals are lacking in our diet, I recommend the Seven Wonders. 
If you're looking for energy boost, there's also the uh, Action 2.0. And there's many, many other supplements you can get a hold of over at chalk.com. I've got a couple examples right here by my head. There is the chocolate and there is the cacao beans. If you're into that kind of stuff, if you want to put some of the chocolate in your morning smoothie regimen, however you go about that, go check out chalk.com. They also have stacks or at least lists, I should say, for men and for women. So if you're a, a woman and you're interested in chalk.com, you don't know which ones to get. Check out the stack for women. Try that out. If you're a dude, check out the stack for dudes. I guarantee you that you you'll, you will enjoy the Tonkett Elite for sure if you're a guy. Um, Chalk.com, C-H-O-Q.com. And be sure to use the promo code J-A-Y-5-0 to get 50% off. Chalk is an excellent, awesome, based red pill company. They've been uh, our sponsors for almost two years, I think. So we love wow. Chalk.com. So be sure and use the promo code J-A-Y-5-0. That's J-A-Y-5-0 to get 50% off. And if you want a little more discount, you can use the promo code JAY53LIFE. That's JAY53LIFE to get 53% off. The other thing I want to remind you guys about is that you can get uh, tickets to our event in Hollywood. We'll be live with a five hour event that includes philosophy, that includes comedy, that includes uh, getting to go meet and see Jamie Kennedy. He's going to be doing stand up. So there's your tickets right there uh, at our uh, LA venue. That will be July 6th in Hollywood. So go ahead and get those tickets right now. Also, be sure and subscribe to our buddies, our uh, co-sister brother podcast over there on Grand Theft World at Rockfin. That is Richard Gross podcast, Grand Theft World, the best podcast when it comes to geopolitics and the current events in terms of news, what's really going on. Richard is a forensic historian and he's one of the best out there. So be sure and subscribe to Grand Theft World it's literally the best geopolitical news podcast out there. So um, getting back to the red pill issues, uh, uh, one last thing I would say about this paper to sum up was just that the individuals who were uh, engaged in a lot of virtuous victimhood signaling were also very quick to make use of any crises. And so the paper actually notes that they were often uh, never let a cr good crisis go to waste because this allowed them, as it says at the end of the paper, to utilize a tactic. And so it is specifically a known tactic amongst these people, whether they have this consciously in their mind as a tactic or whether just sort of innately doing this as a, a, a sort of a, a, a innate scam that they know about and it's just without thinking about it. Second nature, I don't know. But he says that basically it's the, the paper says it's a resource extraction scam for social influencing and to gain social status. That's the key crux of all of this. And how relevant is that to social media? So if it's a mm -hmm. tool for social influence, that is victimhood status, you better believe it's going to be used on social media. And we see it everywhere. And once you read this paper and once you're aware of this tactic, this scam, you're going to notice it all in all in, everywhere. You're going to notice that the people that are claiming victimhood status that are uh, engaged in Machiavellian techniques and strategies, psychopathy, narcissism, that triad is usually amongst, uh, usually what characterizes the people that are mostly signifying their virtuous victimhood status. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's all over the place at, at, at this point. Our, our society, no matter what sphere you're in, really, um, do you want to get into where do you want to go next? Criticisms, uh, general criticisms. I know sure. you had a sort of a plan for it. Um, I would say let's begin with like for those listening, what is masculinity? How would we as traditional Christians define what masculinity is? And maybe we can then go riff off like what exactly the manosphere is talking about. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of what I was thinking earlier about uh, a philosophy of these things. Right. So it's, it's not like there's some self-evident idea of what it is to be high value to what it, what it is to right. be uh, high status. I mean, in relation to what says who? I mean, exactly. what, what is that? Right. And so the same thing goes with what it is to be feminine and what it is to be masculine. They cannot be social constructs. They have to be actually existing qualities or metaphysical realities. And I think that if right. we, we're going to need a worldview or a system that actually posits that. Uh, and so I would say first and foremost, that's where we got to start. Yeah, we got to have something that grounds the notion of masculinity beyond just uh, uh, traits. So um, being buff. Okay, yeah, that's a masculine trait, but is that the essence of masculinity? 
attaining wealth. Okay, yeah, that's a thing that a man can do and it can be a positive thing. It's not inherently bad to have money or to have wealth. If you're going to be in the world and have a family, you got to do that. I mean, right. even even monks ask for money and they gain wealth. Okay, so it's not like there's some realm where, oh, well, well, we don't do that because we're good vices. Look how virtuous I am as a Christian. I don't believe in, in money. Yeah, yeah, right. Like Paul says the labor is worthy of his right. Even the, the apostles ask for money. This is ridiculous. So... God is not, so God is the author of money. Right. Do people not realize that? Do you realize there's a lot of principles in the Bible that deal with money, that deal with fair weights and balances in Proverbs? That's fair transaction and value, okay? That's not inherently anti-religious or inherently worldly. Now, love of money is an idol and is evil, but money itself is not bad, it's not evil. So if it was, then there wouldn't be the tithe. This is so obvious, right? So look, money and attaining a wealth cannot be the essence of masculinity. So these are traits that would accompany or are part of masculinity. But there's got to be something more than any of these traits that can also be to a degree had amongst females, right? For example, females can be good in battle. I'm not saying that's what they should do, but they could be. There are really buff women on Instagram, which I find to be really gross and weird, <laughs> yeah. but they can be strong. So does that, is that what character, so are they there for men because they're strong? No, there's got to be more than certain traits that we find that accompany men, right? There's something more spiritual, something more philosophical, it's more theological ultimately. And I think ultimately it goes back to uh, these ideas being grounded in the, the doctrine of creation, man being right. created as Adam and Eve. Right. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Uh, being made in the image of God, first of all, is what gives us a unique ontology as mankind. And so this evolutionary worldview doesn't really privilege uh, the That's unique great status point, yeah. of, of men and women. So, I, and I always say, I use a metaphor that well, men are the... Ca Go ahead. Yeah, well, one point on that, which is that a lot of the red pill people, for example, the manosphere people, they will say women attained a cunning nature because they were the weaker sex to survive <laughs> and what, which, okay. I don't have a problem saying that that's true. Okay. So, so when women were, you know, in ancient medieval times or whatever, maybe, or in the think of the middle middle Eastern world, when women were like property and they, a conquering tribe might take over another tribe. And now if you're a woman to, to survive, you're going to have to rely on your cunning and not your physical strength and prowess. Right. right. Okay. Maybe that's, that's true. But if that's a, an evolutionary survival trait and the feminists are engaging in using cunning and dark triad traits as the paper notes, then why do you have a problem with it? Why is it bad? Yeah. Seems like that's what nature is as exactly. secured from them. Yeah, they, 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 won't, they have no answer for it. And that's where ultimately, and we'll get back to it, is like, I would love to ask somebody after going through and highlighting like all the ills and all the misfortunes against men, this gynocentric worldview is say, well, why do you think that is? Do you think this is just so happens? Cause they'll get into like Rolo's talked about 21st century thinking versus uh, 20th century thinking. And so somebody, when he tweeted that vasectomy tweet, they said, well, uh, that's a great way for your, for your lineage to stop. And he said, Oh, focused on lineage. That's so 20th century thinking. And I'm thinking, no, bro, that's like what a man thinks about is I want to have sons. I'm the last male of my family line. Uh, and it and that goes generations. Just so have I'm the last one and from my dad's line. And so I want to have sons. I would like to have multiple sons so that my name and my genes continue on. That's that's like a sexual innate drive for men. Men want their lineage to go on. But Anyways, what I was going to say is I always use this metaphor on my stream that men are the castle walls and women or children are the jewels. And so men being strong in their values become erected boundary makers and they prevent things from taking and, you know, in let's say pillaging the jewels, the women and the children. We look at our society because we're so weak. Who are the ones that are most most affected by this boundary dissolution process in our society. And I would say it's the women and the children, because you look at who's taken over female sports, who's taken over female locker rooms, who, who is, you know, focused on, uh, you, you know, aberrant forms of sexuality that are v involving minors, even when they call themselves maps, you know, as I'm sure you're talking about, I want to avoid any, any hot words here, but 
um, what a man is, what masculinity is, I would say, are actually tied to things that are non-physical. So the way that the manosphere often describes what a man is, masculinity, is going to tie to material things you can touch, his body, how much money he has, his size of his house, how beautiful his wife is. And it's like, really, as a Christian man, what I would think about what defines a man is really masculine is like his courage, his honor, his skills, um, his self-sacrifice, which again, we can see from Christ, the old, the, a man takes responsibility for things and he puts things on his back and he deals with them. And so uh, a man or high value man, like I, I would love to ask him, okay, high value man. Well, what what are the high values? Because yeah, well, I mean, how can, how are you gonna how are you gonna have values without value judgments and without uh, virtues, right? Virtue right. ethics really is the only way out of this whole dilemma, and the only worldview that gives an account for virtue ethics, I would argue, is the one that we have. Hence, what part of the reason why we have it, right? So, right. As, as somebody in the chat noted correctly, yeah, I mean, the reason that a lot of the manosphere's ethics are uh do what thou wilt is because that's why they tend towards that libertarian ethos and right. i'm not saying I, everything in libertarianism is wrong but i'm saying that right. if the ultimate highest principle of libertarianism is just my own self-interest in the sense of my own pleasures then there's no then that leads to a power oppressed power might makes right dynamic so that right. you you would have you have no reason to say then that if a feminist and the left is engaging in these manipulative dark triad tactics to beat us, then you have no basis to say that's wrong. They're just doing what is their power dynamic, right? Right. So exactly. we, yeah, we need a basis for virtue and vice. And so you're going to have to have some kind of ethical framework of system. Right. And that's where I would argue a high value man lives up to the highest of values. And so then you would, then as a Christian, we can then define what those values are. And then men trying to embody them and live up to them, characterize what a high value man. And that may then lead to material success, wealth, um, physical fitness, status, all this stuff. I'm not saying that those can't be byproducts of the virtues that we would then posit as Christians. But there's a difference. Which one comes first? We're focusing on the virtues and living up to an objective standard that pre-exists creation, we would argue, then this idea that a high value man is really just attaining wealth and social status for the utility and access to more women. Well, that seems really gay. Uh, that doesn't seem like somebody who's like self-sacrificing because as you said, this libertarian ethos within the manosphere. Well, is not well, about well, they, it's a, well, let's it's about so acquisition. So Rolo says, so Rolo says critiquing Jordan Peterson that uh, you shouldn't be, manning up for the sake of a woman right that was his whole critique so peterson was saying well it's the men's fault time to man up you gotta man up bucko <laughs> and and, the, and his 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 argument was man up for women right you've got to man up and engage in all of these self-sacrificial practices for the woman and rollo's critique was why do i have to man up for the woman in a classical liberal worldview Right. If Jordan right. Peterson's worldview is the, is the case, there's not there's no there's nothing that's like impels me to have to man up for for what for a situation where I'm going to get screwed over. That doesn't make any sense. So there's got to be more to it, right, than just right. manning up for a woman. And ironically, the player sort of game attitude is like, well, I'm gonna uh, do everything in my self interest just to have pleasure. But it's like, wait a minute, you're still oriented towards doing everything that you're doing for women. <laughs> so it's like, right. I, thought, I thought you were trying to escape that. And that's the logic of the MGDAL guys who are like, no, you're still serving women when you're in that attitude. So you see, uh, it's time to just be an incel, bro. And let's just go play video games. <laughs> right. No, you're, 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 you nailed it. And I would totally agree with that. And that's why living up to these higher values and objective values, you shouldn't be becoming a high value man to get a woman. And that's where in my speech that I did at Montanica, the theme of the, the conference was seek first the kingdom of God. And my point was that if a man wants to become a man, he needs to do that. And if he does that sincerely and includes his physical fitness, it includes the idea of that his 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 job, his career is tied to his spirituality with God. Well, seek that first, seek the kingdom of God first, and then working on every aspect of your life. And then provident God can bring the woman who's looking for that quality of man. The problem with the orthosphere, and, and I apologize, I'm stepping on some guy's toes here, is they want women, and they're not the type of men that those women would want. 
And it's like, that's where you have to be a little bit more self-aware. And that's where I would totally agree with the red pill and the manosphere talk about uh, male uh, growth and and yeah so let's myself. just be frank here there's a lot of dorks and they don't know how to talk to women they've never talked to a woman they're terrified of walking over and uh you know make initiating conversation i mean come on it's time to stop being a dork that's that's the key right here. And, and 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 i had dude i'm not kidding i talked to one guy he was like man you know there's really cute girl at my parish and i was trying to talk to her and i was like well what were you talking about theology bro why are you going up to girls that, like <laughs> Total, see, total ignorance, online, total this ignorance is not for women, bro. This no. is not, not, not women that women are definitely interested in some women. But I'm saying if you're going up to a girl at a parish that you think is cute, don't be talking about the energy essence distinction. What are you doing? Yeah, uh, this is a total misunderstanding of what a woman is and how she operates and how she thinks and what a guy is and how they operate. Right. It's it's the it's the exact uh, flip of what you were saying about the career women who think that what men want is what they are portraying through their career. Oh, great point. This is the flip They're version of that point. where the nerd guy thinks that, oh, girls are going to like me when I show that I've read all the church fathers and I can activate the access energy distinction and I can talk. No, they don't. No, you just come <laughs> off as a complete dork and because women are not wired for that, right? So right. if you want to get a girlfriend, number one, Work on your appearance. Number, uh, uh, work on your gait, the way that you walk. Don't walk yeah. around like a spur with something stuck up his butt, running around like this yeah, all the or time. Or shuffle, shuffle your Don't feet shuffle. around all the time. These kinds of things are where you want to focus, like learning how to act like a normal human being, right? A person who can have a, 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 a mundane conversation. You might be a nerd who doesn't want to do that, but if you want to be able to get around in this world, you need to learn how to do that, how to have normal conversations about normal stuff, Right. 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 And so, um, yeah, uh, finding objective virtues and values to aim for, that's what a man should be aiming for. And we look at history like men were all about honor. And so is it, that's why so many men were willing to sign up and die on a battlefield because, OK, I'll get married at a young age. I'll have children at a young age. And now it's time for my honor. And so maybe I'm enlisted in the military or I go do something or I build something like we just have no honor as men in the present world. And I would say this would be a critique I would aim at the manosphere is they don't talk about honor enough. The this idea is, of getting, yeah, it's all utility. It's all, it's all commodification. It's all consumerism. It's like, bro, that's, well, that's not because something. they're, that's because for them, it's all tied to libertarianism and the pleasure right. principle and utilitarianism, which the, the connections are all there. And it's like maximizing happiness is max, not maximizing the moral calculus pleasure principle, right? Going back to Bentham right. and all those guys. But that's because yeah. their whole their whole ethos is eminentized, right? So everything that they're talking about is eminentized because it's a materialistic uh, idea of what exists and what men's telos and or orientation is. So if you don't have right. a transcendent telos, then everything's going to be oriented to the here and the now and just oh, the pleasure point. principle. So... We need yeah, right, virtue right. ethics. That's classical ethics in the sense of you can even go to the uh, Aristotle, right? Right. And if you look at Ambrose, for example, St. Ambrose, uh, we had uh, Dr. Uh, Sean Stead when he presented his paper a couple years ago at the Sophia conference. He showed how what Ambrose does is just take the classical uh, Greek virtues and apply them in a Christian context. And that's, a, that's essentially what uh, David Patrick Harry is doing here. He's saying, look, there's these principles that people like Aristotle talked about courage and honor and these kinds of things. And they can be, they absolutely are part of our worldview because we do have right. a virtue ethic. Right. And that's what you as a man should be focused on. And that's why, again, I was at, at Montanica talking to a group of people and I knew I was talking to 20 some year old, 30 year old men who felt like they were again, almost consumers of the manosphere. But you ask them, they have no purpose, they have no skill set. And I'm not I'm not stepping on anybody's toes or mocking anybody who feels that way of their life right now, because that's a real problem just based the way that our world is. And so I would then as a as a advice would be again, that's why you need to pray. You need to get in touch with God. You need to really focus on working on yourself, developing yourself, self-development, so you, that you can figure out, oh, okay, I'm good at these things. I'm not good at these things. And 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 work, work, work on yourself, focus on what's in your control. And then 
do they focus too much on what's out of their control? Like the women. Yeah. Like, dude, so, yeah. Whining you, and complaining about the things yeah, that they can never. Whining and complaining about women. Things when, that you can never change or fix, right? This is a classic thing of all leftists, which shows that these people actually just have a leftist mindset, which is to whine and complain about the things that can never be altered or changed. And, you know, if, I'm not a Stoic, but if you've read Marcus Aurelius's Meditations, which we've done a whole yeah. lecture on that, the Stoics had a great point, which is that, look, why are you going to focus on the world and all the things that you can never affect or, cha or, or, or change. You can never change what somebody's doing a million miles away. You're never going to change everybody's mind about whatever you think about this or that, right? It's like, it's like Marxists and this sort of idealistic perception that they have that I can fix the world and change everybody's mind about how they think about equality and fairness and all this stuff. No, you can't. The Stoic would say, look, fix. you can fix what's in your life. That's within your domain of something that you can fix. So focus on that not on uh, problems a million miles away that you don't have any connection to and will never be able to fix. It's ridiculous. Right. Like, like the Great Reset, you know, things that we talk about, people are so focused, and even in our orthosphere, they're so focused on things that are out of their control. It's like, bro, look, you're, you're 30 pounds overweight, man. And you're, and you're asking for a virgin girl? Are you serious right now? Like, have some self-awareness and work on yourself. So that's a huge That's part. a great point. Yeah, the lack of self-awareness. Exactly right. And and not and, and I remember in my 20s, when I was a super nerdy theology guy, I remember having to learn these lessons as well because it was like, uh, you know, I was probably 20 pounds overweight. I was drinking beer all the time, constantly drinking. I mean, I wasn't an alcoholic, but I'm saying like, you know, drinking every weekend. And, you know, well, uh, all the conspiracy stuff, all the problems in the world. And it's like, well, wait a minute. What have I done to actually change my own situation, right? I'm whining about all this stuff about, oh, the New World Order and all this kind of And that's all true. But what's that going to just put me in a black pill situation? What, right. what, what am I going to do with a black pill situation? Would just be miserable? Right. And no, I, that, you have to take the initiative. And that's where I would say the real white pill then, although it's difficult, is that suffering is tied to being a man. And you have yeah, to embrace that. Point. That's that's what we that's what we do as Christians. But you have to realize that the only way you progress is suffering. The only way you look good in the gym is by suffering in the gym, by exhausting your muscles. The only way you read all those books you read, the only way you do overviews of Carol Quigley is that you suffer through the discipline of going through it. Christ is the ultimate representation of what a man is because he did. He took the most suffering. He took the sins of the world that he wasn't even responsible for. And that's where taking responsibility, taking ownership, and then realizing that suffering is not something to be avoided or you're going to be a, in your coom pod. You're going to be of these libertarian ethics where, again, like you talk about these uh, only focus on the immediate moment, immediate pleasure, the avoidance of suffering. If you're trying to avoid suffering, the devil already has you, bro. Because you're going, you're, you're like a, you're like cattle that are just being herded right into the pen yeah. where you're going to be slaughtered. Well, I'm going to be really precise here because a lot, I can already anticipate what a lot of like MGTOW or men's rights guys are going to say. Oh, so you're telling me that my job is to totally be self-immolated on the altar of marriage <laughs> and getting screwed over in the, in the marriage courts and that that's no. my duty as a man. No, 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 that's not what we're saying. That's not mm -hmm. what I'm saying. The point mm -hmm. is that, look, life is going to bring suffering. So it's going to be part of life. I'm not saying you need to try to, in some weird sadomasic, masochistic right. way, oh, take right. on ridiculous, yeah. absurd levels of suffering. That's weird and crazy. But right. rather, the attitude of a lot of the manosphere and the red pill people is, oh, I'm going to live for pleasure and thus avoid all suffering and just live for my, you know, my, my uh, moral calculus pleasure points. And that's actually a feminine, uh, uh, that's a, a form of, I'm going to have my own little security blanket of my feelies and all this kind of stuff. That's a, <laughs> that's a, that's a gynocentric way to live. Right. Exactly. And I would say even, even I would say, you know, Justin Waller has some good things that, uh, to say about men's issues right now, but him saying that I'm not, I'm not wired that way that I would definitely, if I was married and had kids, I'd still have to have multiple girlfriends. Um, that's feminine. That's a lack of if even if you have that temptation again as a christian and he calls himself a christian identifies as a christian that dying to the world is part of that suffering so even if you have those temptations for all those other women not acting on them is actually part of your salvific journey that's that's part of your again being a man and like defining more boundaries 
so that's where my again if we were looking at criticisms my first criticism is like what exactly is the role of masculinity in men and and for them men are just supposed to make money gain status and then get with the the best woman you can and then I mean, if so you want it's you just can have, he, so you can it's just he, it's just hedonism I mean, it's, it's like what <laughs> like how is that a better choice than any of the other options of what we were so there's all of this uh, ruckus and, and whining about the status of things and then the answer is what just just pleasure point this is like the, the spin more yeah, the, plates bro the, the, no the mice that are pushing the little thing that gives them the oh the, the yeah the cocaine yeah yeah that's exactly what they are and and that's why the grift is so profitable because the the the, the men just want more of the cocaine they just want more of the pleasure um so what is the ultimate point of becoming high value for the manosphere? And this is generally speaking on, on many of the people I've listened to. It's so that you can have autonomy and choose the woman that you want and have more access to women. And so the discipline that they talk about is always fitness, money, career. You focus on all those things and you get the, you get all those game attributes elevated. Now you can focus and you can just pick pick the girl you want. And it's like, well, then the next question is, um, what is the role that men play in society? Is it just to get with women? I mean, cause that seems pretty futile. I would say it's to build structures. It's to build society. It's to contribute to something that is beyond who I am. My goal right now is to build something, get married, have children that, that last longer than I do. That's the point of a man. And the, the lack of any focus on children and marriage, I think, is really an undermining of what men should be doing. And I would then agree with them that, well, why would I get married if, you know, if, if my girl, she's just going to get unhappy and she's going to divorce me and I'm going to lose half? I would agree. That's why you have to be religious. That's why the woman that I'm marrying believes in God so much right. that she will well, do exactly what I say. Well, one one thing I'll say where uh, I will give uh, one point to the Tates as opposed to Rolo is that Rolo will say that he doesn't believe in conspiracies and that none of this really relates to like a conspiratorial thing going on. Mm. Whereas at least uh, I know Tristan has, and I talked about it, but right. um, there is a push on the part of elites to... Uh, promote the idea that uh, everything is equalitarian, that men are bad, and that we shouldn't have families. And here's the ironic part of that, which is that a lot of these red pill people actually serve to help destroy the family. Right. And if, if they're helping to destroy the family, then that's fitting into this overall elitist narrative. But I mean, right, because the women hate the new, the feminists, I should say, hate the nuclear family. So one of the, the biggest yeah. enemies for the feminist, egalitarian, leftist, communal, communal, whatever you want to frame it as, is to do away with the, with the nuclear family. Why? Because yeah. it's paternal and exactly. it's patriarchal. And it's like, if we're then promoting masculinity, we should promote men to become the best men that they can be, to get the best women that they can have, so that those women will submit and have the biggest and best families they can have. That would, to me, would seem like the, the, the general sphere, but it stops short of that last part of legacy, of children. And I would say it's because they have no transcendent value. They have no God. Yeah, it's all immanentized. The relationship under. Yeah, everything is immanentized. That's why it's all yeah. just utilitarianism. And so, like, I'm getting married, and maybe they'd call me a cuck or whatever for doing that. But it's like, well, I'm taking a vow with a woman that we're going to be together into eternity. And we're very serious about that, and we both believe that. And there's no there's no idea of divorce. We're going to – and so – but that's only because of the, the, the prerequisite values of the religious worldview that we've both adopted. And so if you want to be a man and you want to get that young girl, it's like you better be religious. And that's where, again, I'm not promoting Islam, but I can see then the, the rational mind of these young men. Like, oh, well, I'll just become Muslim then, because the reason why that woman will submit to you is because she's Muslim and she believes in that worldview. If she was some West, Western OnlyFans girl, like, why would she submit to you? If, if, if women are hypergamous, as they say, and they're only interested in your, your, you know, how you look and then your money and your status, and they're always going to be opportunistic and get the next one, well, then why would you even be with a secular woman? That makes zero sense. And yet they're still advocating for how to pick, you know, PUA, pick up artists and how to get secular girls and take them back and sleep with them. It's like, that doesn't make any sense to me. It's like you guys are creating the same thing that you're fighting. 
It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it's just the inverse of the feminist, right? So uh, we're coming up on two hours, and uh, we want to get to the Super Chat. So if you want to, go ahead and uh, if you want to finish up your list of critiques Yeah, yeah. So I had, um, what are men willing to die for? That's that's something I asked uh, Uber Boyo, one of my buddies, comes on. He's a Nietzschean. We've got into it multiple times. He's a relativist. And I'm like, bro, like, what do you, you talk about masculinity and like the Ubermensch and the Superman, but like, what are you willing to die for? And he thought about it. And it's kind of like himself and his family. And okay, I can give you that. But it's like a man has to have something to die for. That's reason, you know, people would go to war because they had pride in their family. They had pride in their nation. They had pride in their, in their mother tongues and all this different stuff. So for me, I have the patriarchy to die for. I have orthodoxy. I have a family. And then I'm going to create my own family. And I'm going to put the onus on taking care of my parents. For example, you know, my my mother's not in the in the best health. Well, I'm not letting her go to a nursing home. I'm going to put that on my shoulders and I'm going to take care of her until she passes away in my own possession. That's that's a sense of responsibility. And, and so ask him in, like, what are you willing to die for? is a huge thing on if you're living just for yourself or you have a larger purpose. And then, um, hold on, hold on. So to the people that maybe you guys just joined people like Hanzo that are complaining in the chat. So we've already given all of the concessions to the areas that we agree. So yeah, if, if red pill is, uh, helping nerdy dudes figure out how to go and have a conversation with a woman. Absolutely. Great. We agree with that. Yeah. That's a, that's a good thing. I'm not, we're not just lodging complaints. So right. you missed the first half of our talk where uh, we, yeah, yeah, we agreed with uh, actually probably over half of what the manosphere talks about. Like I have the agreements right. here. The world is against men and privileged women. Modern secular relationships are terrible and falling apart. Women on social media are out of control and narcissistic. Right. Men need to improve. Uh, beta simps. Men need to become more masculine, high value, pure women. Uh, and then the average woman overvalues themselves. That's another fact is that the average woman due to social media, because they can get, so, they can garner so much attention through photos. The average looking girl thinks she's a dime piece, right? Which totally then again, if you're the average man, you're, you're like, you're totally disenfranchised and even engaging and getting at a woman. That's probably right at your level. Like you guys technically probably should be together, but because of the secular frame of the social media and everything, these girls totally overvalue themselves. So, yeah, we, we were already talking about this earlier, the Neil Strauss's book on how to, you know, and I think that there was a lot of nerdy dudes at that time. I'm trying to remember what, um, when did he write this? This came out in, I think the 2000s, right? And this, I mean, and this came out around the time of like, you know, mystery and when mystery had that TV show on E or whatever, uh, I still don't see a date. So anyway, I think it was a 2000, right? So yeah, we already I, went through the, for those in the chat, yeah. maybe who just jumped in, like it was 2005 is when this came. That's out. what yeah, I was going to say. I think it was yeah. 05, 06, but yeah. Um, so, and, and we yeah. already went through all of the positives of, okay. So, uh, learning social dynamics, right? There's a lot of nerdy dudes who don't know anything about social dynamics, never walked up and talked to a girl, never had a conversation. And actually the internet and everybody being atomized and living on the internet has made this even worse to where even in person yep. people who don't know how to have normal conversations. And bro, the, even the priest at Montanica, like I, I, my speech at Montanica was on the manosphere and, and young men. And then I talked to Bishop Maxime again, multiple priests there. And they're like, yeah, uh, you know, we, we get these young guys all the time that are just, you know, and they say, well, what, you know, what can we do? And I said, what would be good is if orthodoxy and just priests, because we have a patriarchy, if they just became more aware of the situation that young men are facing, and there's just a conversation, not that the church has to do anything. There doesn't need to be an initiative. There doesn't need to do. It's just that if the priest understood the sort of social context, that when a young kid comes into the church and he is feeling the brunt of everything we're talking about, the priest says, oh yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. I know exactly what's going on. And then he can teach him because uh, like you said, this awkwardness, the inability to talk to women, uh, you know, to being totally backward, la lack of self-awareness, the way they dress, the way they look. It's like a man has to teach you this. Your mother is going to tell you you're cute. Yeah, no well, part of this, a man yeah. has to give you reality. Part, yeah, part of this is uh, a gener generation or two raised by single moms, and so they never had a yeah. dad in the household like exposing them to the realities of the world and like 
saying, look, dude, you look like a nerd, man. Come here. <laughs> Seriously? I go, why are you, wa- why you walking about. like a stick up your butt? You look weird, dude. That's disgusting. Come here. Let's let's fix you, right? That's that's the thing is like the today's society thinks of that as shaming. And, no, no, no. It's shaming for the purpose of you bettering yourself, you see. <laughs> right. There's that's, a level to which what... shaming is necessary. Exactly. That's why bullying and hazing, again, I'm too, not to the extreme, but in you can a go bit, crazy with it. Yeah. Thing. Because we men, if you've played sports, if you've done anything, we naturally sort ourselves out on a hierarchy of competency. And we know that. You go play sports, you know, you're going to know who's the biggest and baddest dude pretty quickly. And if not, there's going to be violence to sort of sort that out and establish it. And so we bring reality to children. And so these young boys who grow up with single mothers, who have no male role models, uh, they are so lost. I do one-on-ones with them. They, they're, they're really, really lost. And that's what I was telling the priest. I was like, you know, you just have to understand what these young men are going through. The, many of them have no male role models. And you as a priest, you don't need to do anything. You just have to be aware so that you can fill that role. And they can belong to a patriarch. They can belong to an institution. They can belong to a community and then begin to find themselves. Well, one thing um, I realized as I got older, which I didn't understand when I was younger, but I understood as I got older, is that, you know, guys, men, dads, they have this added, they're problem solvers. Just na- right. we're, we're problem solvers naturally. So when we see a situation, uh, you know, we see a nerdy dude over there in the corner standing away and he won't talk to the girls because he's scared or whatever. Uh, like we assess that and we see the problem right away and we think, okay, how are we going to solve this guy's problems? Uh, he needs to know, like, dude, you're a, you're a dork. Right. You need to hear that. It may hurt a little bit, but you're not. There's never going to be advancement until there's getting over that pain, that hurt, like you talked about with lifting weights, right? Same analogy, right? right? You're going to have to go through some of this pain. And by the way, it's not just physical. There's psychological and emotional weakness too that people need to need to get over, right? So right. a lot of people think, oh, you're mean when you debate, but you're so mean. No, I'm not mean. I'm actually just telling you how it is and how it needs to be, because that's how guys are. Guys are problem exactly. solvers. It doesn't exactly. come from a place of being mean. It's that so many people are so soy, they can't take a joke or they can't take somebody saying, oh, you're wrong without they're losing their mind. Their world collapses. Right. And that, and then they want to complain about somebody else being in their fifis. No, bro, you're in your feelings. You're emotional. Like, that's the problem. Like, maybe you should have got punched in the face and gotten a few fights when you're younger. Maybe you'd be a little bit tougher. These young guys have no tough. No, that's what I'm saying. And- like, I, I got my ass beat, like, at least two or three times, right, when I was in high school. Uh, now, one of those was legitimately I lost the fight. Another guy, like, uh, sucker punched me, so I don't really count that one. But I that did get – I, I still got beat up, right? So I got multiple times beat up in high school. I won a couple fights, too, so it wasn't, like, all losses. But – uh, and I, but I wasn't some big brawler. It's just weird to me that like that experience to me, which was, you know, a handful of fights in high school, not that big of a deal. Like, I don't, right. I think a lot of dudes have never been in a fight. I, I agree with you. I know for a fact, I talked to him. I was like, bro, you, you ever been in a fight? No, I've never punched anything. Never, never hit it, uh, a heavy bag. Never, you know, <laughs> it's like, bro, like. No wonder you're lost, man. Wow. Like you, you have no toughness. Like, and so that's something that men give to other men. And that's where I think the church orthodoxy, just being the last vestige of the patriarchy, if just priests, it just became common knowledge that, Hey, these young men coming in, we're going to have to be more than their spiritual father, a male role model for them. Cause they have none. That would well, be that's huge. what it needs to be. Unfortunately, that would be huge. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, a, a sizable section of uh, so-called orthodoxy is just as soy and just as it is pitiful it is. as Let, everything else. But go ahead. Yeah. Let's get yeah, to the, super, the, go ahead. the. Yeah. The, yeah. The priests at Montanica weren't. But that kind of wraps it up. Um, you know, my my ending point is that men need a patriarchy to belong to because that's how we learn what it means to be a man. And that's why orthodoxy is really the last home for a man to be a man. And for a man to have a religion and for a man to have a value. So you want to you want to blow out feminists. Well, bro, like if you're just some atomized young guy online and you're like debunking feminist logic and all this different stuff, but then you don't belong to anything masculine, no patriarchy, no tradition, no value system like, bro, you've already lost. Like you can you can blow out the feminists or you can, you know, critique uh, modern women and only fans and you can still be a traditional man with values and religion and with tradition and with the patriarchy and with the community. And so my last point was that boundaries are the new frontier. This is something that Father Russell in Montanica was talking about. 
is that, you know, men have always looked for the frontier. That's what the the battle was, you know, the the battlefront, uh, exploring America. You know, if you've yeah. driven across America, like, it's amazing to think that, that ancestors, especially if you're a Native American or Native of America, like, they went all the way to the Pacific Ocean before cars, bro. Like, they went across the Rocky Mountains, like, the desire for the frontier, and you look at them, the the men today, it's like, what the hell? You guys couldn't have done any of that. And so the new frontier, if you really want to find the the leading edge of the masculine battle, it's to it's the boundaries. It's the virtue. It's the honor. It's the glory. It's all the truth. Defending objective truth is like a radical thing right now. I mean, it's just finding these boundaries and defending them, not taking one step back. And that's where the church gives you a perimeter. Like you were looking for a fight. The church gives you a perimeter that we as men can put our heels on it and face out against the world and take no step back. We don't compromise our values. We don't allow feminism. We don't allow degeneracy. None of this stuff's allowed to enter. And that's on us. And that gives us a purpose. And that gives us a front line to fight against. And that's kind of, that yeah. kind of sums up what Agreed. I wanted to say. Speaking of that, there's going to be a big trad cap barbecue in Atlanta that I'm going to be going to, uh, hopefully this summer. Uh, and I'm not joking, brother. We're all going to be boxing. So I applaud I the trag. It. I'm probably going to get my ass beat. I don't care. I'm going to go box a bunch of trad cats and, uh, I'm going to get a few, <laughs> I imagine I'm you'll a, get a few, I'm going to get a few licks in You're even, even if I get my ass beat, I don't care. I'm going to, I'm going to get a few licks in on the trad cats. It's, but it's my buddies though. It's my, I have friends that are trad cats who are like, dude, you got to come this year. We want you to come box. We have a gigantic barbecue. 150 people are coming. We, I'm like, yeah, I'm there. I'm gonna box all 150 L track cats. Not really, but I'm gonna box all. <laughs> but uh, let's get to the let's get to the super chats. Um, I'm not joking, by the way. I'm really am gonna do that. People are gonna be, oh, we gotta film it. We gotta film. We need, we're gonna we're gonna beat we need to ass. do a celebrity ortho versus Catholic boxing match. I, dude, I want to actually. I want to fight I'm somebody down. in the creator clash. I really do. Like, I I, I, I would, would love to. I don't even care if I get beat up. I want to do it. Like, it doesn't matter to me. It's, it, to me, it just sounds fun. It sounds like a blast, right? It sounds like a blast. Uh, but it's got to be somebody in my weight category. Oh, so, for sure. So no, somebody no. was like, you going to fight a bar? I don't think a bar was in my weight category. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Who, I don't know if a bar is in anybody's weight category. But uh, I mean, if we could find somebody, uh, I don't know if we could find up, dig up Butterbean and see if he's able to fight. Uh, Butterball. Butterball. Butterbean. Oh yeah, my yeah if he could, he could fight a bar. But um, and by the way, I'm not some kind of badass fighter, dude. I, I'll pro Again, I'm probably going to get my ass beat, but it just sounds fun to me. I don't care. That's that's how guys are. Guys are like, yeah, I'll, go get, guys I'll go get beat up. I don't care. <laughs> but so, but the fact, you see, that's like a masculine spirit, though, even whether you win or not, just to go to the fight. You're willing to go to the fight. Like, that's, dude, you talk to a lot of these young men, they, they run away from a fight. And I don't mean just a physical fight. I mean the state of the world. I mean, and I, I equated this with... Uh, people like, oh my gosh, look at the, look at the U S I'm fleeing. I'm, I'm going to, I'm, you know, name a country. It's like, bro, where are you going? Like the, the as, as father Josiah Trinamoy says, we're Orthodox. We don't run. If, if the devil's here and he's destroying, then we stand. That's the I, point. Yeah. Uh, I was talking to, uh, Tim Gordon and we were talking about boxing. I, I feel like Tim will probably would, would beat my ass. But we're he, still, he looks like a pretty athletic. He, he's dude. a pretty buff dude. He probably yeah, would be my ass, athletic. but I, I would still box him. I don't care. All right, let's go to the super chats, guys. Circle G three dollars. Does anybody remember the OG men's rights channels from twenty twelve? Uh, I remember all those. I, I read. You talking about channel or you talking about articles? There was a girl who writes what she was doing with men's rights videos ten years ago. So I'm not sure what that is, but I did I did follow and read all that stuff even back then. Damascene thirty dollars. Jay, that was a great five hour debate stream. Can you share your story though about the first time you went to a liturgy and you felt uh, the theological difference from Roman Catholicism? Uh, did you experience the English liturgy hitting you differently? Thank you. Yes, and that was mainly because number one, I'd never been to an Orthodox liturgy. And that was like 2006 or seven. And I went to an Antiochian liturgy. I'm sure everybody's familiar with the famous Antiochian church in Franklin, Tennessee. That was my first exposure to it. Um, and it was in English. And uh, it was before they had built that big giant temple that they have now. It was in a smaller uh, parish back then in 2006 or seven. Still really, really beautiful. But um, I was coming from years of the Latin mass. Okay, so it's just a totally different feel. 
and it absolutely hit me different. And I basically just said there was a warmth there that was not there in the SSPX Latin Mass that I went to for many years. Adam, nineteen twelve fifty. Oh, was that the church that we went to a wedding at? It was, yeah. Okay, but see that the church that, you that were was at, the new building. That's the new building, yeah, yeah which is awesome. But um, yeah, the the older parish was a lot. It was a lot smaller back in the day, and and the parish was like really intimate and you know maybe a hundred people max but oh, anyway wow. yeah it's um, huge now yeah it's huge it's grown so much uh and we have a lot of friends that go to that parish it's a great i'm not i'm not dissing it or anything like that we, we go to the road court parish but when we're in nashville but um anyway adam 1912 by the way guys if you would uh we're gonna do super chats if you want to send in your super chats now is the time to do it for, man. for either myself or uh david Adam 1912, 50 bucks. Will you do a RuPaul debate? I appreciate you guys. Work, turn to the left. Work, turn to the right. Cover girl, give us a twirl. No, I'm not going to be debating RuPaul because I would lose. So I don't, I would never, ever sit, uh, step into the ring to debate RuPaul. Noah Kais, $3. I apologize this is redundant, but what do priests like Father Damick so frequently, why do they so frequently denounce you? A friend of mine told me that he attended catechesis in Virginia, and the priest said the same thing. Is it all because of NGOs, or is there legitimate contention? So I did a video uh, maybe four years ago, five years ago, addressing the whole reason why he, out of nowhere, decided to come after me. Uh, it's, a, it's a silly story. It had to do with just uh, stuff he tweeted about, uh, quote, incels and everybody that followed my audience being an incel. He had to uh, do a public apology by the way, for calling a, a bunch of young men incels, which he, which is funny to me, but uh, it had to do with me criticizing um, ancient faith radio back in the day. And uh, he took umbrage with that and wanted to defend ancient faith radio, which was promoting all kinds of liberal stuff. He then tried to come out and do damage control and uh, said, no, it's not actually liberal. I'm going to get rid of the liberal stuff. But, okay. Well then why was I bad for talking about it? So, you know, Go watch the video that I did. Uh, it's on my channel still. It's had almost 30,000 views. Tape TB1892. Thank you, guys. I'll be baptized in Rokor very soon. Thank you for your hard work. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Lord TJ, God. $3. Uh, I want you to do Esoteric Hollywood 3. The first two are some of my favorite bo books. I'm working on Esoteric Hollywood 3. So. Oh, man. Dude, you're you're a workaholic, man. I totally respect your, your work ethic. Thank you. Yeah, we do work really hard over here. Grew up non-denominational, says Glitchy Rhythm for $5. The Orthodox Church makes more sense than what I grew up with. Uh, yeah, I think it doesn't make a lot more sense than non-denominational <laughs> stuff. Absolutely. How do I get over... I get overwhelmed by church history and how convoluted it can be. Do you have any book recommendations to highlight the basics? Uh, yeah, I mean, Michael Welton's book, Two Paths, is a great introduction to church history. Father Meyendorf has a good book called The Orthodox Church, which is a good introduction to church history. The Damascene, $5. Do you have a favorite hymn? Um, I mean, the Orthodox Church has a ton of liturgical chants, and I like a lot of those chants. I like a lot of the chants that we do, for example, during Easter. I don't have a particular favorite hymn, though. Do you? No, not any in any particular one. Um, I like the Cherubic hymn. Uh, that that's one, but uh, nothing really. I don't know. I just enjoy the entirety of the liturgy. Gary, a hundred dollars. I'm a big fan of you both. Thank you for helping me into orthodoxy. Thank you so much, Gary. It looks like you've Lord won this. Gary's won the super chat uh, competition tonight. PBF Live, forty dollars. <laughs> this is a great stream, homies. Thank you so much, PBF. Um, Palantir $1 Kotel makes a great point about men having something that they're willing to die for. What does the average secular man have to die for without any family in the West propositional notions of the constitution and civil rights? Uh, in other words, hypothetical, uh, 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 the question is like not being serious. No wonder everybody's nihilistic. Yeah, exactly. There's what's the point. If everything's nihilistic, then you know, why does your pleasure even matter? Rachel Wilson, $5. Thank you so much for the stream. Happy to see both covering it. We need smart, strong Christian men influ influencing this sphere. Yes, I'm sure that uh, David and I both will be dipping our yep. toes into this uh, sphere as best we can. Queen, $10. Hi, Jay and Kotel. No hymen, no diamond. <laughs> Hanzo, $5. Apologies, Jay. I will watch the first hour. Yeah, you don't have to apologize. It's all good. There's a lot of people click in at different times, uh, but we did... 
And I did a stream a couple nights ago uh, about uh, Red Pill where I talked about the areas where I agree and areas I disagree. Storm the Cat, $3. Can you do a Jay Dyer impression? Yes, I've done it the entire stream. Dave, <laughs> fight the third, $50. What are your thoughts on dating versus courtship? Uh, this is a great question. Um, I would say that if we existed in a more traditional, healthy society, courtship would be better. And it's right. definitely possible for uh, Orthodox circles and, and even outside of Orthodox circles. I know Calvinists and traditional Catholics do set up successful courtship situations. But even those, a lot of times it's really difficult for those to be successful, not because courtship itself is bad, but it's so much of the modern world is totally opposite and contrary to that, that it's just very difficult to run parallel societies in this society. It's not impossible. It's just really difficult. So I think that it's really hard to avoid dating in today's world. Um, most people are going to go that route and it's just kind of, gonna, it's just, that's just the reality of where we are. And I've, I've also seen the problem of over the years, certain really hardcore traditional uh, circles, whether Protestant, Roman Catholic, and, and maybe even Orthodox, they'll try to have really strict, extreme views of courtship. Uh, and the moment somebody fails to ma match up to that or they make a mistake or they fornicate or whatever, oh, it's the end of the world and everybody collapses and it's it's this huge, right. it's this huge scandal and then people lose their faith. And it's like, it's, it's really extreme expectations for where society has gone. So it's really hard, I think, to... And I think Rollo Roll has actually a good point about this, which is that a lot of these uh, trad e-girls that suddenly are trad e-girls, right? Yep. And they're on the internet as the trad e-girl. Like, yep. this is all just uh, performative, right? They're not yep. really trads, okay? And so they will promote this idea of all of this... Like we're living in the 1800s. They're over here on freaking Twitter acting like it's freaking, they're going down to the saloon, you know, and I mean, it's not, we don't live in the 1800s. You're not going to be able to right. make everybody live like it's 1800s. Yeah. The grift of the, the e-girl trad thing is pretty fierce, especially on TikTok. Um, in regards to dating and courting, I would recommend, I would agree with what you said. We just don't live in a society where traditional courting uh, can exist in that context. The way that I went about it, trying to find a traditional pious Christian girl that is worthy of marriage and is on the same page that I'm on is to be 100% straight up front and straightforward is that what I've noticed is I talked to some of these guys and they're real reluctant to, to say what they really want because they're afraid it'll, it'll push her away or do X, Y, Z. And you're going to have to get over that. If you, if you want a traditional girl on the first time you guys talk, there should be at least be brought up of like what your expectation or what you're looking for. And so I would recommend every man to be very straightforward with what you're looking for and what you want and be willing to say no. That's what these girls don't hear. They don't hear men say no. If you're one of the few guys that you're like, oh, oh, you're into that. Okay. I'm not really interested. It was nice talking to you. See ya. They're going to actually be more curious about you. And so be willing to say no, move on and be 100 up front uh, because we just don't live in a society where you can, you know, have families vet each other and court and do all this stuff. It's just, it, we don't live in a world like that. Hood rat 29, $1. Why do Protestants say the law is done away with? Why do they direct this towards the church? Does the church believe Levitical law is done away with or the Mosaic 10 laws? Uh, well, how we interpret the law being fulfilled is going to kind of differ depending upon what tradition you're coming from. So a lot of Protestants will sort of classify anything like liturgy or vestments as part of the law being done away with. And so it's kind of an easy way for them to just sort of hand wave liturgical worship and this kind of stuff. Orthodox Church has a totally different paradigm for how they look at what elements carried over into the worship of the church. So that's a really kind of a long involved question. And I have a lot of live streams and uh, my, my friend Lewis did a really good documentary on Orthodox worship and its continuity with the Old Testament uh, and its and its services. So go watch that documentary that he made over at Orthodox Shahada. Palantir one dollar. How can Orthodox guys that are serious about their faith engage in fasting and gain, get gains from weightlifting? Well, did you know that weightlifting is actually an Orthodox thing? That yeah. 
I mean, people don't know this, but I, so that's a question. For you. You're a, m a much more dedicated, obviously. A well, lifter. multiple priests. I've had priests come on that are. I have a. I had a priest that who's a bodybuilder. Uh, like literally competing know, bodybuilder. Father Moses in uh, Texas is like a huge, gigantic buff bodybuilder guy. Father Russell at, at the Holy Trinity Serbian Church in there in Butte, Montana. Lifter. Lifts all the time. What he does is he tries to use protein powder during the Lenten fast. So he, the, it's all about macros. So uh, when you're in a when you're in a high intense fast like the Lenten fast, meet your macros. Try to get your proteins where they need to be and your carbohydrates, and do the best you can. If you're constantly working out, your body's going to show it. So wh what I've noticed is a lot of people want to use things for excuses. You just got to go be consistent. Consistency always wins. And just get your macros in. That's what, again, I have priest on. That's what they always say. Well, just do the best you can. And if, and if you are in a place where you need something, talk to your priest about it. That's the point. Talk with your priest. Yeah, it's also, it's not, uh, fasting is not all just food. People get think, people think fasting is purely and solely something to, to do with diet. No, that's only part of it. In fact, fasting also has to do with almsgiving. Hunter, $5. I'm excited that you're coming to LA. Just don't drink the water. Uh, I never drink tap water, and I would remind people, too, if they do want to get tickets, get tickets to our show in the show description. July 6th, we'll be live in Los Angeles, Hollywood area. It's going to be a lot of fun. Amanda, hug and kiss, $1. How would a theoretical situation occur where the Orthodox monarchy is established anew? How is a monarch founder chosen? Well, just simply by the coronation of the church. So uh, it doesn't have to be a... Uh, like going through genealogy books to find some descendant. It could be that. I mean, I think there are descendants of the Romanovs in Russia. So theoretically, Russia could have a uh, another monarch. Uh, but if you look at the Byzantine model, it was not it was not solely on the basis of genetic lineage. So there's a lot of different ways that that could occur. But the uh, authority comes from the coronation of the church. So there's different possibilities for how that could be. But of course, orthodoxy, is, we're not mainly concerned with some, that's like a trad cat mindset of like our concern as to how to fix the politics and get a Bayes trad political leader. That's like <laughs> secondary to what we're focused on. Our focus is the theology that we think leads to then down the road, uh, other political uh, solutions like monarchy. And, right. and it should be a patro, you know, patriarchy and monarchy go together, I, I believe. Uh, and, and I don't think that, uh, you know, a female monarch is ideal, by the way. Um, all right. So that I think is, uh, tonight's show. Thank you guys so much. A lot of great, uh, comments and insights. Uh, I have David's, uh, channel church eternal logos is linked in the show description and, uh, look for more work from him and more debates. Um, yeah. thanks I'm, for having me on brother. Yeah, absolutely. Great. It. it was a great chat. Uh, Palin, I, I, yeah. Yeah. We got another we got another super chat. Palantir says oh. during Great Lent isn't the uh, goal minimal caloric intake? I'm not trolling. It's a actual question that we are supposed to make. So he's arguing is the purpose of Lent to emaciate yourself? I don't know if that's the purpose of Lent. <laughs> what? I I don't think so. Uh, I've never heard. All right. Of that. Uh, all right. Thank you guys. Everybody have a good uh, good night, and uh, I'll talk to you guys later. God bless.